I think this will probably go down in history as one of, if not the largest financial crime ever. I cannot imagine a scenario where $8 billion just disappears. Bankman Freed has pled not guilty to multiple fraud charges. Sam was just too important in the crypto community. When someone says, I'm gonna give a billion dollars in the next two years, like that catches everybody's attention. As time went on, their ideas got like weirder and weirder. I don't think he even had almost a conception at some point that it was wrong or right. I think he just had the mentality that he has to win. This committee will not stop until we uncover the full truth behind the collapse of FTX. So, Mark. Are you in? I'm in. I'm in? We're in. Will this be the last of its kind? No. This is the nature of capitalism. Get over it. The top names at the Fed are on Bloomberg. The economy is, is handling much higher rates, at least for now, without difficulty. So notionally, that, that might tell you that, that the neutral rate has risen, or it may just tell you that we haven't had rates high enough for long enough. The bond market has tightened quite considerably. If financial conditions are sufficiently tight, our work is not necessary because we don't need to boost them more. Nobody covers the Fed like Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and Radio. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, China Open. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. From the world of politics to the world of business, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, hosts Anne-Marie Hordern and Joe Matthew, alongside Kaylee Lines, deliver news, insight, and analysis live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. Get the latest from and about politics' biggest power players at the end of every trading day. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, Bloomberg's The Fed Decides, it starts right now. This is a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Bloomberg Surveillance, The Fed Decides. Keen, on the afternoon, it is The Fed Decides. There's a countdown clock. We don't have that in the morning. We welcome all of you. John Farrell on assignment. Spoke to him, though. He looks for a rate cut. Oh, we, so? John Farrell, <laughs> he looks for a rate today. cut. We'll see if we get that. See if he finds um, it. As well. The news is moving, including a really important op-ed piece to get us started here. We'll get to that in a moment. Lisa, your thoughts as we go into this meeting and the key press conference. There are a number of key questions that I think are percolating out there. Number one, how hawkish can the Fed be without <clears throat> hiking rates further? Because if people are talking about a hawkish pause. Is the Fed behind hawkish the curve pause. when it comes to inflation? To, yeah. Can we get down to 2% uh, <clears throat> inflation without more pain in the economy? And then, of course, geopolitics. I am curious to see whether it's inflationary yeah, he's got to have or a disinflationary. He said it last time, so yeah. he's going to weigh in this time around. It's going to be fascinating, folks. It's become more fascinating in the last 24 hours. I was sort of like snooze fest. <laughs> and I was wrong. There's a lot of tension here in the data check. We'll get to that green on the screen. We started red on the screen early this morning, this afternoon with futures, you know, they're up 13, the VIX 17.63, some movement in bonds. But I got a DXY, a 107. The global economy is speaking about this Fed meeting, and that global economy says strong dollar. There is a divergence in the U.S. economy with the rest of the world. We have seen that continually. We saw that before when it came to Europe coming out uh, with a recessionary outlook, <clears throat> but disinflation. Does the U.S. have too right. much growth? That, I think, is what people are grappling with. Coming up, just to give you a sense of what we have on deck, because we have an amazing roster of guests to weigh in on what some people call the Super Bowl of economic days. Uh, the former Fed, uh, vice chair of the Federal Reserve, PIMCO's Richard Clarida, will be joining us, plus Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank. Then at 2 p.m. Eastern, immediate reaction from KPMG's Diane Swank, Morgan Stanley's Matt Hornbach, wow. Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab, and Greg Peters of PGM Fixed Income. And finally, breaking down 
Chair Powell's news conference. We have former New York Fed President Bill Dudley and BlackRock's uh, Jeff Rosenberg. To me, this is going to be a pivotal moment, Tom, not just in terms of what the Fed says, but how it's taken by the market. Bill Dudley agrees with you. Let's go to an important op-ed by the former head of the New York Fed and, of course, his tenure of duty at Goldman Sachs as well. This is really, really a key comment here from uh, Mr. Dudley. Uh, in the 1980s, Volcker had to inflict a severe recession on the United States to undo the mistakes of Arthur Burns, who allowed inflation to get out of control in the 70s. Powell, Chairman Powell, is amply aware of the history. Nonetheless, he's risking a repeat. We're going to go with Priya Misery here in a moment, but Lisa, your thoughts on this fiery essay by Dudley, who will join us later. He's on to something. I mean, he has been. He's been ahead of the curve in terms of calling for rates Way to be ahead. higher. Yeah. We have seen Jolt's report coming. Yeah, the Jolt's report <clears throat> earlier today came out stronger than expected. We saw ECI, the Employment Cost Index, hotter than expected. Are we seeing enough disinflation? Are we really right. seeing enough loss in the momentum in the labor market? Speaking of loss, I got a market up 24 Dow points. I got some SPX up three tenths of a percent. Keith Briette and Woods Bank Index. It's slightly south this morning. Let's begin. Priya Misery with his portfolio manager, J.P. Morgan Asset uh, Management. Priya, you nailed the inversion. Now we have a disinversion. Will we fully disinvert where that 10-year yield finally is higher than the two-year yield? I think for a true disinversion or a positively slow peel curve, I actually think the Fed needs to start to cut rates. You know, I think this bear steepening has sort of run its course. So for really the next leg of steepening, the next 100, 200 basis points, I think the economic data has to be a lot weaker and the Fed has to be more open about starting to cut rates. So I think we have to be a little patient on the yield curve here. When we start to see data, which in our view is going to happen over the next 6 to 12 months, data that's weak enough that the Fed will have to start to signal that maybe they've gone too far, I think that's when the curve will become positively sloped. But we've come a pretty long way here. I think the next move is actually lower rates rather than uh, you know, further uh, uh, sort of steepening of the yield curve. What are you seeing in the data that supports that, given the fact that we see job openings ticking up unexpectedly, that we see employment cost index go Going up uh, relative to expectations. How do you justify a softening? So that's a fair point. If you look at data, it's been strong. You know, um, second quarter was strong, third quarter was strong. The last month of data has actually come in stronger than what most people were looking for. But I think, it, you know, this is, is this noise or is this a re-acceleration? When I look at financial conditions, I look at real rates, look at how high real rates are, you know, 10-year real rates, 2.5%. I mean, that is restrictive. We're well within restrictive territory. It just needs some more time. You know, the famous long and variable lags, I think they're playing out. We're coming off extremely low level of real rates. And so if consumers, if corporates have essentially termed out their debt, it's going to take some time. We're seeing cracks you know, developing um, in, in terms of credit, you know, credit card delinquencies, debt levels. Why is the consumer taking on more debt? You know, I also think that the labor momentum is starting to slow down. So as the job market softens and, you know, consumers realize that that debt that they're taking on is actually expensive and becoming more expensive by the day, I think there's going to be a, a reduction in spending. That's essentially what's going to then turn this virtuous cycle of the labor market and spending into a, a more negative cycle. And I think we're seeing early signs. It looks like a soft landing right now, but I would caution every hard landing starts looking like a soft landing first. Priya, do you think that it has helped or hurt the Federal Reserve that they've been talking about the long end of the yield curve doing the work for them? You know, I think they're trying to buy time. They, they have to strike, Chepal has to strike this very fine balance here between sounding vigilant, vigilant on inflation, they're sure that they want that 2% target um, and, and that they remain committed to it. And then being cautious because they need to, they need for these lags to play out. They know that they've done a lot. And now that the long end has moved, I would argue that the economy is a lot more sensitive to long end real rates. Long end real rates have, sign have significantly increased. Financial conditions have tightened. You look at bank lending surveys, they are tightening. So I think the Fed has to, yeah. and you know, which is why it's going to be a very tricky Fed message, I think, today, where they're going to try and sort of walk this tightrope, yeah. but buy time. I think they want to see how policy that they have tightened significantly, how is that playing out in the economy? And I think you just sometimes just need time for this. Right. Uh, Priya, you're at uh, J.P. Morgan, and it's called Fortress Diamond, but really, folks, what it's called is Fortress Michael. And you guys are sitting around a bond table there in asset management, and you've got to ask 
Look at the banking industry, not JP Morgan, but look at the blended Keyfree Ed and Woods index. And it's, I, the word I use this morning is the stock market of banks is grim. Is this chairman going to be distracted in the press conference about what to or what not to say about American banking? You know, I think he, uh, Chair Powell has to acknowledge that credit conditions are tightening. You know, can the market, can the capital market take the place of the banks to some extent? Yes. But, you know, is that enough to offset where the banks seem to be pulling back? If the banks are dealing with, you know, deposit outflows and inverted yield curve, I think that's arguing for less loan growth. And that is negative. Now, partly it is the intended consequence of tightening. I think when the Fed starts to raise rates, remember, they're also doing QT. That's tightening policy every single day. Um, they are trying to tighten conditions to slow the economy down. But they have to be careful. Is the market running away with, with that narrative? Which is why I think we've seen a, a subtle, I would argue, shift in the Fed reaction function. They are uh, acknowledging the big tightening in credit conditions and financial conditions. So, you know, I wouldn't say that it's all that, that that's all that matters. I think the Fed is looking at economic data, which includes inflation. And I do think some of the inflation trends are moderating, as well as financial conditions. And they need to see how the two are interplaying, what, what the interplay between those two are for the real economy. Priya Misra, always wonderful to get your view. Thank you so much for being with us. And Tom, you have been talking about the banks, and I think it's really a well-taken point, because that is the credit transmission mechanism for a lot of uh, small businesses, for a lot of right. individuals, particularly the regionals that have, have been in a world of hurt. I can't say enough about that idea of it being the transmission mechanism. And Mark Cabana of Bank of America to this morning was incendiary about the place of the banks now. He says they are building cash, building cash, building cash because of the unknowns. And I, I just think the Federal Reserve and, frankly, other Washington institutions have to be front and center, not about the memory of the spring, but what the new memory will be of Q4 with these banks as they get to year end and have to account for a, a difficult challenge. And you love this discussion, the long and variable lags, and just me. how much that's going to end up being part of the conversation, because essentially, that's what they're saying. Just wait for it, and that will suddenly uh, slam well, into <clears throat> reality. I think the long and variable lags are simple. High yields are killing them, and you can go higher for longer, higher for shorter. I like normal for longer, maybe, as one theory as well, but these are the conversations uh, we're going to have today. Let's set this up uh, right now. we got 20 minutes till we get to the announcement. Michael McKee, I believe, will stop by, and we've got a whole bunch of other people coming up. Lisa will tell you about that. The data. We're in 12 ginormous basis points on the 10-year yield. 481, the 30 year bond under 5%. Even the two year yield on, uh, down seven basis points, 5.02%. Lisa, the market on the move before this Fed meeting. Coming up, so pleased to say, former vice chair for the Federal Reserve, PIMCO's Rich Clarida joining, plus Deutsche Bank's Matt Lazzetti. That conversation with both of those tremendous individuals coming up next. This story did come around as something that's a bit different. There is a dark side to it. It's hard to even talk to people about these chemicals and tell them, look, there's a chemical that's in you that's not found anywhere in nature. We've all been used as guinea pigs for the last 70 to 80 years. We weren't told we were being exposed, but they did it anyway. This right here is the shadow fleet. To actually see clandestine behavior was really surprising. That makes you think, well, what else is going on? A lot of people let Agnes down. What she was told is exactly what happened to her. It took the lid off a much bigger problem. I think that's probably the most shocking part of this whole thing.
the Fed is going to hold. Hold. Hold the course. We'll have a more hawkish hold. Hawkish hold. A very hawkish tone, but a pause. It's pretty much consensus. We're not expecting a surprise. High for long will still be an important part of the narrative. Beating that drum of higher for longer. The continued strength of the economy actually handcuffs the Fed. Economic data in the U.S. has been quite resilient. The resilience of businesses, the resilience of the consumer. The labor market that is just, you know, very strong. The Fed is looking at all of these data, the juxtaposed with inflation that's still too high. Communication is still that inflation's too high. The Fed uh, is, is probably going to want to keep its uh, options open to hike more. Unless Jay Powell diverges widely from that narrative, I don't think this Fed meeting is a big market mover. I don't think it'll be an uninteresting meeting. These FOMC meetings, these are like playoff games. Welcome to the playoffs. This is Countdown to the Fed exactly. Decides on Bloomberg oh, TV and great. Radio. I'm Love Lisa Abramowitz. I do, too. And he's right on in terms of how people are looking at this particular meeting, although the markets are set up after really talking about the refunding agreement. I know, Tom, you probably were thinking maybe we could get away with that now that we're in the Fed meeting and we don't have to think about, you know, the refunding <laughs> announcement that came out earlier that really whipsawed a lot of things. It goes to the, the number of narratives that are out there right now. We've got to do a market check because things are moving here. We've got two important guess. How do you begin your year-end outlook? If you're Matt Lazzetti at Deutsche Bank, I mean, he's got to pop 32 pages off. He can't, like, you know, plagiarize Clarida over Columbia. Lazzetti's got to pop off a uh, year-end outlook. I mean, do you do it on November 1 or do you wait for December 30th? <laughs> I think that you wait for March 31st and do the back <clears throat> Exactly. Month. What we're seeing, though, in markets definitely is green, uh, given the fact that people are uh, pushing into risk following this their bid to bonds. I don't get that out. Given the fact that seems to be a little bit of nervousness taken off the table with some disappointing ISM data, Tom, as well as a refunding announcement that wasn't quite as significant in the long end that people expected. We're going to go quickly here. We have two wonderful guests now to prepare us for the Fed meeting and then Michael McKee at the press conference as well. Richard Clarida is with PIMCO. He's global economic advisor, yes, the former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve System, but far more holding cult at Columbia, hurting Nobel laureates for Columbia Economics and also providing original research on the dynamic natures of our American economy. Matt Lozetti out of UCLA is chief U.S. economist at Deutsche Bank on a tight timeline here. Vice Chairman, let me go to you first here. As you look at this meeting, and as Bill Dudley says with Bloomberg Opinion today, this is a meeting and a set of meetings fraught with risk for Chairman Powell. What is the major risk the chairman faces? Well, Tom, I think he has a communications risk. I don't think we're going to get any news in terms of either the decision or the statement at 2 o'clock. But I do think this is a high-stakes uh, press uh, conference um, uh, because uh, there's a meeting coming up in just six weeks uh, in December. In September, 12 folks on the committee thought they'd need to hike uh, once more. Uh, that's the camp I'm in. If I were still there, I would think at least one more hike is needed. Uh, and But right now, market is not really pricing that in. And so I think he needs to discuss today's right. uh, meeting, but also to tee up his outlook for the next meeting. Matt Lazzetti, we had Priya Misra on with her great call on deep inversion early in the year. You have the mother of all calls. You were out front saying recession is distant. I've got a GDP Q3 going to a GDP a Q4, which is in the Lizetti recession direction. Do we have a recession coming up as we address this meeting? Look, I don't think it's going to be the focus of today's meeting. Uh, I think the focus will be the strength in the data that we've really seen since September. We've had a strong jobs report, yet a strong retail sales report, you know, inflation report that was showing some some strength. Just this week, we saw job openings remaining high and the employment cost index uh, with some strength. So I think it really is about um, you know, the Fed not raising rates today, keeping open their optionality to raise rates in December. And really, if they do need to raise rates again, I'm not convinced that they are, are done with just one and done. Um, you could see some, some resilience in the data. That, that remains, and it'll depend on whether or not financial conditions remain very tight and continue to do the Fed's work. Matt, what's your one question to Fed Chair Jay Powell? I, I think an, an interesting one from my perspective is there's a lot of parallels today to what happened back in March, which is that the Fed is not raising rates or being less aggressive because they're looking at the tightening of financial conditions that are taking place. But we learned what we learned back in March is that it didn't come through and flow through to the economy as much as we might have thought. And so uh, is there a risk here that they are moving in a somewhat more dovish direction? But 
the financial conditions right. tightening that they're anticipating doesn't feed through to the economy and risk that they have to do more later. Matt Lazzetti, one final question. Is this a collegial board or are there deep divisions as we see at the Bank of England and among the nations of Europe? Look, I think, I think they've been um, remarkably cohesive in decisions over the past 18 months. Uh, I think as we look ahead, it's just natural that there's going to be more disagreement. I think you're getting to the point where two-sided risks are more real. The, the risk of over-tightening will become more significant. The, the risk of under-tightening will be more significant. Uh, and so I, I anticipate that as we look ahead, there will be more disagreements. But you know, I, I think Chair Powell is very clear. The number one um, metric from their perspective is that they get inflation back down to target over time. I, I I think that it will, you know, the, what we're seeing today is that it might take further tightening from their perspective, and that while getting inflation down to 3% didn't take much pain, getting from 3 down to 2% um, might take a little bit more uh, pain within the economy and labor market. And that's definitely what keep, what's keeping up a lot of people at night. Matt Lazzetti, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Uh, this is the countdown to the Fed to size on Bloomberg TV and radio. We're moments away from a Fed rate decision. Still with us, we are so glad to say. Uh, Rich Clarida, the former Fed vice chair. Rich, I want to pose that question to you that Matt Lazzetti was just talking about. Are we on the brink of another March 2023 moment where the Fed pulls away from raising rates even in the face of hotter than expected data? Well, obviously, other things were going on uh, in March. Later on, we had we had SVB and, and, and the like. Um, I, I do think, and I, I give the committee credit for getting off, you know, the rate hike hamster wheel. And so they've, they've shown that they can both hike and pause. And I certainly, if I were there, would be OK with a, with a pause uh, today. Uh, but I hope it's a hawkish uh, pause, because I'm, I'm with Matt. Um, the, the progress that we had seen on inflation has stalled a bit. Uh, the labor market is still uh, red hot, which is a good thing. But wage gains are really not consistent with uh, the inflation target. So I think, I think they, they, the, the messaging needs to convey uh, that uh, determination. Rich Clarida, April 4th of this year, writing for The Economist, the former vice chairman. But it is likely to be something more like 2 point something than 2.0. Drag us forward from April 4th when you shook the economic world. Is 2 point something 2.5? Or does John Williams need to get used to 2.9? Well, look, what I'm trying to communicate uh, is that the Fed's primary goal since March of 2022 uh, has been to get inflation substantially lower. It was running at five. It's now running in the low threes. I am of the view that if next year in 2024 inflation's running at two point something, right. and point something could be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or 0.7, they will say, look, we've made a lot of progress. We can start to dial back and start to adjust rates downward. Chris Waller's done a good job of explaining uh, that. Um, it'll be a nuanced message, but I think it'll be the correct message. But we can't put the cart before the horse. We have to get infl inflation down to two point something on a year over year basis, uh, and we're not not there yet. Richard Clarida, we'd say, you know, lower Milton Friedman, we're going to go out longer with variable lags and all this. That's from another time and place. Forward here, for Chairman Powell in all, do we have an America that is together where we have a common economic theory, or is this a Fed making it up as they go, including here at 2 p.m.? Well, Tom, I think you may be on to something. Maybe I wouldn't put it quite that way, but I do think central banks, the Fed and other central banks, uh, are about to enter a period where there's going to be an active public debate on uh, the merits of the inflation uh, uh, target. Right now, inflation is very unpopular. Everybody wants lower inflation. But so far, we haven't ha really seen any consequences in terms of higher unemployment. You know, at some point, the pound Fed may run into that trade-off. Uh, and, and given the nature of what else is going on in the country right now, that could be a divisive discussion. Right now, we're looking at a, a myriad a number of issues, including geopolitics. We heard Jay Powell talk about this in the past number of weeks, where he did raise this as something they're watching and seemed to indicate that it was disinflationary, not an inflationary potential shock, the way the others have been received. What do you make of that? What do you expect him to say today on that front? I think that he probably won't 
try to break a lot of new ground. Fed officials always want to acknowledge when there are the geopolitical uh, tensions. You know, they don't want to get too into the details of how they're factoring uh, that in. You know, uh, typically when there's when there's war in the Middle East, it tends to lead to higher oil prices, and so there's a pretty standard playbook for thinking about that. But also, over time, if it accumulates, it gets into risk appetite, it gets into animal spirits. I frankly right. think it's too soon to tell how this is going to play out. So I think he would stay away from it. Richard uh, Claire, at this meeting, at this press conference, to the December meeting in January 31, I would suggest post-pandemic we find a new science of monetary policy. <laughs> you wrote about this years ago. What is our new science of monetary policy that Chairman Powell right now has to confront? Well, I think he has to confront that in the rearview mirror, inflation's been too damn high. Uh, the Fed and other central banks want it to be around 2%, and the longer inflation remains above that target, the more central bank credibility uh, is, is threatened. And so, so far, I think the Powell Fed has done a good job of keeping inflation expectations anchored. But to your point, Tom, in Clarita Galley-Gertler, our model essentially looked at a situation where central banks were credible because in the past they'd achieved their goals. Right. It's a little bit more complex model when, when you've not done that for three years. But the heart of the matter post-pandemic is Bill Dudley says we have a risk of becoming unanchored. At this meeting, does that need to be addressed? That confidence building, does that need to be addressed in the press conference? Tom, uh Tom, I don't think so at this press conference, because I think so far inflation expectations are reasonably well uh, anchored. Um, but I think the chair will say, as he has many times, including with David Weston not too long ago, that, um, that they are determined ultimately to bring inflation down to 2 percent. But no, I don't think he needs to address that specifically today. He does, though, maybe have to nod at his belief, which is a huge academic question, of whether we need to see more pain in order to get inflation down under control. And we're kind of uh, addressing this from all different angles. What do you think the answer is? Have we gotten anything that gives you a sense of whether we've seen the kind of pain in the U.S. economy to give us back, get us back to 2 percent? Well, Lisa, I am in the camp that it's, it's going to take somewhat more slack in the labor market, which is euphemism for pain in the labor market, than the Fed's September projection. September, the median participants saw the unemployment rate peaking around 4 or 4.1. That would be great, you know. Uh, the, but I think, given how hot the labor market is and how stubborn inflation appears to be in the threes, where they want it in the twos, I think we are going to need to see some more slack. Now, it may just be slower growth. Maybe Governor Waller's right, and the adjustment can occur in, in job postings and quits. But you saw today the jolts numbers are also uh, going in the wrong uh, direction. So I do think it's going to probably take somewhat more pain than, than the committee seems to think right now. And just quickly, what do you think the risk is that the Fed is losing its credibility and is behind the curve in a more meaningful way and needs to take an even more aggressive stance to counteract that? Lisa, I don't think we're here now, and I don't think we're likely to be here in December, but I think it is a real risk in 2024. We could be sitting going into the May Fed meeting with inflation moving up, not down, with the labor market hot, um, and with a committee that may need to re-engage. I don't think that's the most likely case, but I think it is a significant uh, risk. And I think implicitly you heard that from Lizetti, and I think that's in Dudley's piece as well this morning. Rich Clarity, you're sticking with us, which we really appreciate. We are just about two minutes away from the Fed rate decision, which is published at 2 p.m., and then after that, a half an hour after that, we hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell. A lift to the market, NASDAQ up six-tenths of a percent, the S&P up at four-tenths of a percent. Big? I guess it's big, big after lift. three straight months of losses, right? I mean, I guess yeah. that. But it's really uh, come from the drama in the bonds, which have been jerking around everything. Basis points. Wow. That is a massive yeah. move. We're seeing some really big moves in the 30-year bond in particular after the refunding agreement. But really, the 10-year yield still sticking well, down almost 13 basis points to 4.8 percent. In Clarida, with PIMCO, and Ambrose Evans Pritchard over at the Telegraph, his lead right now, this is in the last hour of the of the British evening, inflation is dying and bonds are screaming by. You and I heard that from Ian Lingen at, at, at BMO Capital Markets two months ago. The problem is that a lot of the data has come in hotter than expected. And even right. in the earnings, we've seen uh, <clears throat> this idea of uh, prices going up and volumes also going up at the likes of McDonald's, at the likes right. of Caterpillar. I will say this, in many, many effects, 
Fed meeting. This is the most active Bloomberg terminal I have seen. We sort of look at it, and of course, with the morning we've had, our eyes are glazing over right now. We're looking at the blinking red and green, and there is a real pulse to this market across equities, across bonds, across currencies, across commodities as we speak. You've got a NASDAQ 100, those tech stocks, those long duration stocks, leading the way up eight tenths of a percent on the NASDAQ uh, 100. We have ginormous moves of optimism. Buy bonds, price up, yield down as well, 4.81%, uh, Lisa, uh, down yeah. uh, you know, lower yields. And this really is driving a lot of the appetite. But in the dollar, you are seeing the strength of the U.S. economy. Let's head over to Bloomberg's Michael McKee with the headlines. Mike. No surprises, no news. A few new words. In a unanimous decision, the Fed retains its five and a quarter to five and a half percent target range for its benchmark borrowing rate and retains its language about determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate. The policymakers' assessment of the economy contains some new adjectives, but no new information. Activity expanded at a strong pace in the third quarter instead of solid. Job gains have moderated instead of slowed. Inflation remains elevated. The statement says tighter financial and credit conditions for households and businesses are likely to weigh on economic activity. That adds the word financial to the sentence, and it may be a nod to the idea expressed by many Fed officials that raising market rates are doing some of the Fed's work for it, a reason not to have raised rates today. This is the second meeting in a row that the Fed has held rates unchanged, and although the dot plot suggests one more move by the end of the year, the markets may interpret today's decision as confirming that rates have peaked. That's going to be a key question for Chairman Jay Powell coming up. You see, Mike McKee, we want to get to you quickly here, but we see the market moving, lifting up, equities lifting up higher right now, uh, with the Dow up 80 points, two tenths of a percent, NASDAQ 100 on a tear up eight tenths of a percent as well. The 10 year yield comes in ever lower, bond prices up, yields down, and the 10 year yield 4.79 percent, distant from the 5 percent yield. Uh, Mike, the statement is here, and maybe it's a preparation for December 15th, but it seems to be a preparation for a presumed slower American economy. Into this press conference, do you assume we go from 4.x percent Q3 down to something dramatically weaker in this present quarter? I don't think the Fed is going to put it that way. They took recession out of their forecast a meeting or two ago and basically have said that the economy can grow at a reasonable rate without the uh, without going into recession. Now, uh, Jay Powell has suggested we still need a period of below trend growth. We're nowhere near that now. If we do see it slow down, the question is, does it go too far too fast? Right now, all indications are it wouldn't, uh, that we could see slower growth without seeing recession, uh, and we could see inflation continue to come down. But that's a question for them. They're, are they in damage control not right now, uh, making sure that they don't go too far because they think the economy is going to slow, or do they think they've done enough at this point? Michael McKee, thank you so much. We'll be catching up with you throughout the afternoon. Just taking a look uh, at what's going on, the two-year yield to me, Tom, really stands out, yes. sharply down below 5% as really to Mike's point, the market is taking this as the Fed has done <clears throat> hiking rates for this economic 40 cycle. headlines out now. Mike McKeel have much more on this as well as our, our guest. But Lau Brainerd showed up for the Fed meeting today. She's at the White House now uh, holding court as National Economic Advisor. And let me read this headline. It's a Brainerd headline. Fed repeats it will take a cumulative tightening and lags into account. Draghi would have just said, we're going out to 2025. <laughs> well, and we're not going to hike anymore, because if you think about the cumulative uh, rate cumulative. hikes, have we seen enough uh, from what already has been right. done, or is this a long and variable lags that a lot of people are talking about? Richard Clarida with us still. He is with PIMCO and Columbia University. Uh, Richard Clarida, I look at cumulative, and that just tells me we're going out there. Draghi would have put a date on it. Can Professor Clarida put a date on this longer Fed at this level. 
Well, I don't think so. I think you know the language community has been in there for for several uh, yes. uh, meetings, and it does recognize that the path forward depends upon how much they've done uh, in the past. As I've said, these are always balancing acts. I think the Fed's baseline outlook makes a lot of sense. But if there is a risk, the risk is that inflation is too stubborn. If I were recommending or talking to Jay Powell, I would recommend that he he leave the door open to doing uh, more. He doesn't have to commit to it. Every meeting's live, but but I. I definitely don't think he wants to walk away today with markets seeing the headline as Fed is done. That seems to be uh, certainly at least the initial read on this. One line that Michael McKee pulled out was the tighter financial as well as credit conditions are set to weigh on the economy. They added financial into this. How much do you think the Federal Reserve and the members are concerned about some of the volatility we've seen on the long end of the curve that maybe it's getting to something a little dysfunctional, a little bit less just nicely restrictive? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, the, the short answer is there's probably a range of opinions, but but certainly uh, Chair Powell recently and Lori Logan, president of Dallas, have, have indicated that it, it reflects, it's do, it is doing some of the Fed's job for it. They haven't pushed back uh, uh, against it. Um, I do think that the challenge, uh, you know, having wordsmiths with others, some of these things, the challenge with putting the financial conditions term uh, in this statement is, you know, financial conditions can go up and down and be volatile for a lot of reasons, and then at some point uh, they may uh, they may regret that they included it in the first place. Uh, Vice Chairman, thank you so much. He's a former vice chairman of the Federal uh, Reserve He's System. He's sticking with us. Uh, well, he's going to stay with us? Yeah. Okay, I did not know that. That is very good. Rich Clarita, thank <laughs> you for the generous time uh, today, yeah. uh, given your responsibilities at PIMCO. Joining us now, Diane Swank, Chief Economist, KPMG, and Matthew Hornbach with his Global Head of Macro Strategy, uh, Morgan Stanley. Diane Swank, we're talking rates, we're talking inflation. I believe there's an employment mandate as well, and part of that to all of your Midwestern heritage, are auto workers better paid? How do we have wage disinflation if we have unions garnering this historic pay raises? Well, first of all, I want to um, echo what Rich said is our concern is sort of around May and June, where, where is the Fed going to be? And I think the optionality to have rate hikes still on the table and that every meeting's live is really important. So I really agree 100 percent with Rich on that. I think the issue on the UAW strikes and what they have seemed to have gotten is that, first of all, union contracts were lagging private sector contracts during much of the um, expansion and the frenzied hiring boom. And so some some of this is catch up. I think also it's important that there will be spillover effects in the manufacturing sector more broadly. The key issue is how much will those higher wages spill mm -hmm. over into other manufacturers? That's yet to see, but I do think that's where the tension could show right. up. And it's you know yet to happen. And so they're going to ratify it. These were good contracts and a good win for the UAW, harder for the automakers. But I do think what's important to understand is that many of these contracted wages in the public sector as well yeah. are just now beginning to reset and catch up to where the private sector already was several years ago. Matt Hornbach, uh, what all that Lisa and I have done today, the single moment for me was your Seth Carpenter explaining the Zentner deceleration in this economy from 4.x percent, I know, inventories and that, down to something sub 1% in the Q4. What do our markets do with that deceleration presumed in real GDP? Yeah, well, thanks for having me on the program, Tom. I, I do think that the deceleration will be important and factor into how the Fed thinks about this higher for longer mantra. I mean, it's true that the meeting today didn't really offer too many surprises, but we do have one more meeting before the end of the year. And even though we don't expect the Fed to be hiking rates at that meeting, uh, there is an open question about what they do with their guidance that comes in the dot plot. That I do think is going to uh, be levered to the growth outlook and if we do get this deceleration that Ellen and Seth are looking for, then we do, I would suspect that the Fed may have to 
take a slightly more dovish approach to their outlook for interest rates in 2024 and beyond. Uh, Very importantly, Lisa, the two-year yield breaks down to a new low on the two-year yield, as you mentioned earlier, in 10 basis points, now in rounded up on 11 basis points, 4.98%. This raises this question, how do you have a hawkish pause if a pause is a pause? Matt, what's your view? I mean, how much can really uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell lean into this idea that they may not be done without the market saying, yeah, you've been following us all year? Yeah, Lisa, look, I think that what will be key is Powell focusing on the data dependence of the Fed. We we just got through a pretty strong round of data for the month of September. Uh, we've got two more months of data before the Fed convenes in December. And then again, that dot plot, I do think, is going to be an important signaling mechanism to the extent that they are done hiking rates. They can always double down on the higher for longer theme by taking all of the rate cuts out of 2024. So that's going to be an important variable that investors will be paying attention to. Diane, how much are you looking at the reliance on financial markets to do the work for them at a time when things are volatile? And to Rich Clarita's point, financial conditions can change. How much is that not exactly a comfortable place for the Federal Reserve to be in? Well, I agree 100% with Rich on that. And so I guess Rich and I are just in 100% agreement today. But I think that is going to be a danger for the Fed because they're looking for this doing the heavy lifting for them. It is obviously already throwing a bucket of ice on the housing market. That's going to come up in the fourth quarter. That said, the consumer is remarkably resilient. We've got double the savings we thought we had with the benchmark revisions. And it's getting interest paid on it now. That is really important to take into account. And the strength of the economy, I, I think we're going to see a deceleration in the, it's hard not to, from almost 5% in the fourth quarter. But the consumer is still going to be pretty strong. We're set up to have pretty strong gains still with 2.5% or so gains in consumer spending. The strength of the economy <clears throat> justifies higher rates. And it also brings into question how much restriction we have. And if financial conditions were to unwind and the route in the bond market were to unwind, right. that takes away the restriction that's out there and all of a sudden the Fed has to get back in the game and so that optionality of being every meeting live critical. Rich Clarida, what's so important to me is again the analog that we're conveniently lo- using of taking Powell back to Volcker. And as Bill Dudley writes an hour ago for Bloomberg, he says the arch fear was Arthur Burns who allowed inflation to get out of control in the 1970s. I believe we have a disinflation vector, but should we fear that inflation is out of control? Well, the analogy I would use, which I think the Fed would would want to avoid at all costs, is 1966. LBJ had guns and butter. Inflation uh, was moving up. The Fed hiked. And then they blinked. And they cut in 1967. And what we now call the great inflation, I think, stems back to uh, a hiking episode that got cut short. And the Fed did not reengage when inflation uh, went uh, up. I don't think the Powell Fed would make the same mistake. uh, But that's the part of the history book I'd be looking at and trying to avoid. Matt, when we take a look at how the market is handling this, we're not talking at all about the balance sheet. Should we be? I mean, is that part of the discussion in a material way? Well, Lisa, I I do think that the balance sheet will be an important topic to discuss in 2024. Um, But that's, to us, probably a bit more of a second half uh, of next year issue as opposed to a first half issue. Uh, Nevertheless, you know, we will see the Fed's balance sheet continue to to shrink in terms of its securities holdings. Uh, The the issue that that we would be focused on here is what ends up happening with the BTFP, uh, that term funding facility that the Fed introduced back in March, to see what kind of take up we end up getting through the first several months of 2024. I do think that will be an important factor that we should all continue to pay attention to. Diane Swank, to pick up on what Matt Hornbuck just talked about, and of course we see this in Japan with the arch debate even into this evening. Pay attention, folks. Bloomberg Asia, Ivan Mann and the rest over in Hong Kong following Japan in their odd economic experiment. Diane Swank, are we going to successfully extricate ourselves from what did Nora Rubini call it? QE1, QE2, (laughs) QE3456. I mean, Diane Swank, where are we? I mean, McKee's, McKee's encyclopedic on this. I don't get it. Are we going to get ourselves out of this QEQT model successfully? 
Uh, that's a big question. I'd love to hear Rich's response on that one. I think, you know, what's interesting is the Fed wants to stop well short, is likely to stop short of their objective in terms of how much they drain their balance sheet. That said, the quantitative tightening, the reductions in their bloated balance sheet, they're still going to stop at a level that's much higher than it was in the past. And what we've seen is anytime there is a financial crisis, this is something the Fed, once we get down to the zero boundary, we have to rely on. Now, the one thing that might be hopeful for the future is that that it looks like the non-inflationary rate is rising and that you know we're no longer coming out of a global financial crisis. And if we can avoid another major financial crisis where we literally have to go back down to the zero boundary, we've got a lot of room to stimulate now without going back into the balance sheet. That's for now. And it looks like we'll have some cushion and the descent on rates is going to be significantly slower and end up at a much higher level than we entered uh, the situation at in 2020. Matt, I want to pick up on what you were talking about with the uh, funding program that the Fed has set up for the banks. How much are you seeing signs that there would be serious financial distress if the Fed were to wean the market from this backstop that they created after SVB? Well, well, well Lisa, I mean, banks, of course, have the ability to raise funding in, in other ways. But um, it's clear from the weekly take up at this facility that there are certain institutions out there in the market that feel it's in their best interest to continue to tap this facility. Um, we wouldn't expect the facility to, to go away in, in March, but um, it is something that we, we carefully monitor. In, in addition, you know, when you look at the amount of reserves in the banking system, you know, they've been resisting uh, falling from their current levels. And so in some ways, I think what the system is telling us is that the Fed may have already reached the minimum level of reserves that are required for these banks to continue to conduct their businesses. So we're kind of trying to monitor all of these various signs. And what we see does concern us, I have to say. Matt Harnbach, we're going to have to finish that conversation another time. Diane Song, to both of you, thank you so much uh, for taking the time on this Fed Day. And I've got to say, uh, we have such an ace panel with us, Tom. The fact that we have such incredible names, Matt Hornbach, Diane Swank, Rich Clarida, who is sticking with us, and we are grateful for that. Joining us now to the conversation, Greg Peters, co-CIO at PGM Fixed Income, and Kathy Jones, Chief Fixed Income Strategist at Charles Schwab. And to that point, Greg, do you see things starting to break in the financial sphere that the Fed is kind of papering over with some of the programs that will be key to watch? Oh, I don't think so. I, I mean, I think those backstops are just that. They're backstops. I think there is this persistent worry around the proper function of the Treasury market. So regulators are vigilant around that, as is the Fed. Um, so, no, I don't think anything's breaking at this point. Um, and if you just take the data on balance, it's actually reasonably good. So there's this whole sky is falling mentality out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, preparing for a rainy day is important, of course. But, you know, as of right now, it's, uh, you know, pretty right. bright and sunny. Greg Peters, where's an appropriate inflation adjusted rate? If I look at the 10 year real yield, 2.50 early, early this morning. I know you came in late today, Greg. Right now, 2.39%. We've seen a reduction there, but still way elevated over two years ago. Where's the appropriate real yield? Yeah, so I mean, I think we've been so stuck in this central bank dominant world where everything was topsy turvy upside down, where actually negative real yields was an inducement, right? And that was a, a far cry in how we thought about real yields in the past, right? Real yields are a function of, you know, pretty strong growth, stable growth, and, you know, a little inflation. So I think we're in a much more normal environment right. today. And quite frankly, Tom, I think we're so jaded by this re recency bias when the Fed just dominated the game and pushed real yields to really right. kind of uncharacteristically low levels. Kathy Jones with us of Charles Schwab and her recency bias is clients going, should I buy a money market fund or an eight-year CD? Kathy Jones, you know, I, I look at the moment that Greg Peters was just describing, and just simply all it comes down to me is what do I do with 5% cash? What are you seeing at Schwab? What are people doing off of the Fed action with a money market fund, and I'm going to call it 5.5%. 
Well, uh, we're seeing, again, clients do lots of different things, with lots of different clients, but uh, we are seeing a lot of interest in, say, CD ladders, treasury bill ladders, treasury bond ladders. As people look at where the yields are, and the real yields, which we've been pointing out, have been pretty attractive, they're starting to sort of tiptoe out the curve. We don't have a lot of interest in going very long on the curve, but I think the idea of capturing four, five, six percent, depending on what instrument you're in, uh, yields going over the next five to seven years is looking more attractive. So we're starting to see a little bit of that action. A lot of ladder securities, though, is a way to kind of average into the market. But I do think we we the longer we can hold in some sort of a range and stabilize, and the more we can get a signal from the Fed that maybe there's not a lot more coming in the way of tightening, you know, the more people will get up the courage to, to extend out a little bit in duration. Kathy, I know that you're very interested in the balance sheet and hearing about what the Fed has to say. And we did just hear from Matt Hornbach that he thinks uh, that the Fed has hit the minimum amount required of reserves, that basically we're bumping up against the size maybe the balance sheet needs to be. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, you know, I have only done a small amount of work on it, which is why I want to hear what the Fed has to say about it, because I'd like to know what their thoughts are. And we really haven't gotten them to talk about what's the optimal size. We've had some estimates of 20 to 25 percent of GDP. Now, if you do that, you're going back, you know, we're going down mm -hmm. quite a bit more, put that against where, you know, reserve re requirements should be. And, you know, you're, you're kind of at odds, which is why I find this question of the Fed continuing QT, even when they eventually shift to easier policy, I find that to be a big question mark in my mind as to how that can, those two policies can kind of coexist smoothly. So I don't know that we're at the, the minimum level yet. Uh, I think there's some room to go right. from here, but I am concerned. I would like to know what their a deeper thought process than the little information we've been given. You know, Rich Clarida, what's so important here, and I'm thinking of your conversations during Council to the portfolio managers at PIMCO. And in the moment we're in, there are select people out there saying bonds out in maturity are a screaming buy. How do you frame that at PIMCO? Given what the Fed is doing post pandemic, can you say price up, yield down, and go out in maturities to get total return? Well, that's what, exactly, uh, in, in, in the sense that investors um, can earn returns that they would have been drooling over three years ago by not moving all that far out on the, on the curve. Certainly, if you look at investment-grade corporate or, or, or mortgage-backed uh, security. So what we're saying is that there is a menu of, of opportunities available to investors, but when you can get returns, uh, real rates uh, where they are now, and because we're in the camp that thinks the Fed will succeed in ultimately bringing down inflation, that this is a great a great entry uh, level, and you don't have to take a lot of duration risk. Some investors, because of of their business model, do have more duration risk, but there are opportunities yeah. even if you don't want to add that. This is great. The, the dean of Columbia Economics is bond manager. I think <laughs> I think Rich Clarida just got out a bond ticket and said, "Let's go long." Which is the reason why he's currently at Pimco. Though I do want to just get. Uh, a sense from you, Rich, about the balance sheet question, about whether the Fed's balance sheet needs to be a lot bigger than people previously had imagined, and if we're kind of bumping up against that level. Um, I don't think we're bumping up against that level, Lisa. Remember, the Fed has something, another acronym, the Reverse Repo Facility Program that's got a trillion dollars in it. Uh, that money, once it leaves that facility, will then flow back into reserves. So I think if you if you factor that in, I think there is more uh, road for the Fed to travel to shrink its uh, its balance uh, sheet. Um, I, I do I agree with your prior previous guest. It is interesting that that the Fed has talked about continuing QT. Uh, even after they potentially adjust rates. You know, when I was there in 2019, we stopped QT um, uh, right. before we, we cut uh, rates. So that would be an okay. interesting difference. Professor Clarida, thank you for your generous time today here at this Fed meeting. We're going to let Rich Clarida go here six minutes away from this important press conference with us, Kathy Jones of Schwab and Greg Peters of PGM. Greg, I'm just going to ask you a simple question here, and I'm starting to hear it a lot. Are bonds a screaming buy? 
I think there's a tremendous amount of value in the bond market today, but I want to go back to, you know, do you really want to extend duration? I think you do, but you want to do it very carefully. So I think the shape of the curve matters a lot. You know, Tom, you keep talking about cash, and the, the shape of the curve tells you to be defensive, tells you to be in cash. So if you subscribe to this higher for longer front end rate environment where the Fed can no longer kind of cut down to zero uh, and has that flexibility, then you need to see the curve normalize before you really step in and moss uh, uh, out the curve. So to me, it's really quite simple. The shape of the curve dictates uh, where you want to be on the curve. Uh, and uh, while there is value, absolutely, we're excited about it. I don't really see the need to rush out and lock in duration here. Greg, it seems like a year ago, but we got the refunding agreement, uh, for refunding announcement, excuse me, from the Treasury Department earlier today, and it seemed to move the market quite a bit. Do you think that we learned today that supply right now is trumping any kind of fundamental economic read, that it really does come down to simply there are not enough buyers to pick up the U.S. debt with yields as low as they had been traditionally? No, absolutely not, Lisa. Uh, I, but I know you like to push that narrative. I don't think that's true. I think on the margin, yes, it does uh, put more pressure on the back end. But it goes back to the shape of the curve. Why is the curve inverted when we're printing 5% GDP and inflation's around kind of 3%? So, uh, you know, I think that is really the fundamental dictate here, not so much right. the supply. At some point, it will matter. But I don't think that is the driver today. I think that's more of a kind of a politically driven red herring than anything else. Kathy Jones, it'll be interesting to see how the chairman addresses commercial banking. We've been talking all day about the Keith Briette Index, BKX, uh, really having some challenges technically. And of course, finding a bid has been a challenge, even with the Dow up 100 points, NASDAQ up eight tenths of a percent, VIX 17.43. Kathy, the heart of the matter is the movement of money from deposits to money market funds, and that's the theory here of instability that could come. Do you see those potential instabilities out there in the trust market between deposits and money market funds? Well, I think if there's any issue that the Fed is now very much focused on and has its arms around, it's this one. After, you know, what happened in March, I've got to believe that the regulators and, and everyone else at the Fed and, and in, indeed uh, in the regulatory environment for banking in general is scrutinizing this pretty tightly. So I don't know that this is going to be some sort of a trigger for a crisis so much as something that's going to have to be worked out over time. And I think that that it probably means a lot more mergers among financial institutions yeah. and you know, recapitalization, et cetera. But it's usually not the things that everyone is focused on uh, that, that is, you know, bring up the crises. It's something that no one's watching. I, I can't say enough about this, Lisa. Well, what we've done today and with the terrible construction of the Keith Brietta Woods uh, chart, it's simply got to come down to combinations and transactions. I, I just see no other way to do it. Yeah, although we do see a lot of positivity in the underlying economy, and we see that with the uh, JOLTS report wrote earlier today and a whole uh, host of other components. Greg Peters really was talking about that. So, Kathy, from your vantage point, how much and when do we know that we are underestimating the strength of the economy and the sort of momentum behind this inflation? Well, I think what you're getting at, Lisa, is this question of, you know, what what's the what's the growth rate? What's the underlying growth rate going forward? What's R and R star and all those questions? Um, I think that that obviously a lot of debate around that. There is a strong belief that we've moved to a higher level of economic activity for a lot of reasons uh, going forward than we've had over the past decade or two, and that that means that we're at higher rates for longer, that the resting place is higher than it was before. Um, so, you know, how will we know? I, I think it, in the labor market is probably the key indicator, right? If we start to see an acceleration in jobs uh, and, um, you know, real decline in the unemployment uh, rate, that would be certainly a big surprise. I think expectations are it's going to go the other way since we've had so much tightening in the system. So it'd be a pretty big shock if, the, if we saw that component of the um, economic environment shift 
upward. Uh, I, I don't anticipate that that will happen, but I think that that would be the big surprise. Kathy Jones and Greg Peters, both of you, thank you so much for being with us on uh, the playoffs game equivalent in the economic sphere. Uh, Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Brown was John off today for this Fed Decides. We're about two minutes, about a minute and 40 seconds away from the Fed press conference with Fed Chair Jay Powell. Yeah. And we could see a steady bid into markets pretty broadly on the wake of this belief that perhaps this is the last, uh, we already saw the last rate hike by the Federal Reserve. Yeah, it's, it's ebbed away a little bit, but these are titanic moves. And again, as I said, into the Fed, what's unique, folks, is you watch the screen and you watch the tone of the red and green, not even what the data is, but just the pulsing of the Bloomberg professional service. And the answer is it was way more vibrant into this meeting than I've seen uh, in ages. You see it with a nice equity lift, nine-tenths of a percent in the NASDAQ. Bonds have come back a little bit from a ginormous move, price up, yield down. And even currencies following up off early morning angst in Japan signals strong dollar. I wonder if he's even going to address strong dollar. What I noticed is Michelle Smith got up on the podium there with the flags and, you know, the podium ready to go and all that. And, you know, she addresses the press and says, Mike McKee, you do get the last question. <laughs> that's just, what she was saying. That's usually that's how it works. Yeah. Uh, maybe this time it will be different. Honestly, to me, the big takeaway here is that people are looking for a sense. The Fed has completed their effort to raise rates and now they're going to be patient. That basically seems to be the message. I the market received. You see that in two-year yields coming sharply lower. Usually we have seen uh, the two-year yields kind of be quiescent as we see the moves in the 10-year and the 30-year yields. At this point, some of the big question marks for Fed Chair Jay Powell as he approaches uh, the podium is just simply how much can he really lean into hawkishness without having hiked at this meeting? And I wonder about data dependency. I think we'll see it 14 times. It's going to be very data dependent. And here we see him walking out. Uh, do we have you as well. Let's take a listen to Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. We understand the hardship that high inflation is causing, and we remain strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Since early last year, the FOMC has significantly tightened the stance of monetary policy. We have raised our policy interest rate by five and a quarter percentage points and have continued to reduce our securities holdings at a brisk pace. The stance of policy is restrictive, meaning that tight policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation, and the full effects of our tightening have yet to be felt. Today, we decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Given how far we have come, along with the uncertainties and risks we face, the Committee is proceeding carefully. We will make decisions about the extent of additional policy firming and how long policy will remain restrictive based on the totality of the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. I'll have more to say about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a strong pace and well above earlier expectations. In the third quarter, real GDP is estimated to have risen an outsized annual rate of 4.9% boosted by a surge in consumer spending. After picking up somewhat over the summer, activity in the housing sector has flattened out and remains well below levels of a year ago, largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. The labor market remains tight, but supply and demand conditions continue to come into better balance. Over the past three months, payroll job gains averaged 266,000 jobs per month, a strong pace that is nevertheless below that seen earlier in the year. The unemployment rate remains low at 3.8 percent. Strong job creation has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers. The labor force participation rate has moved up since late last year, particularly for individuals aged 25 to 54 years. 
and immigration has rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. Nominal wage growth has shown some signs of easing, and job vacancies have declined so far this year. Although, although the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still exceeds the supply of available workers. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Total PCE prices rose 3.4% over the 12 months ending in September. Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 3.7%. Inflation has moderated since the middle of last year, and readings over the summer were quite favorable. But a few months of good data are only the beginning of what it will take to build confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our goal. The process of getting inflation sustainably down to 2% has a long way to go. Despite elevated inflation, longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate, and we are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2 percent objective. As I noted earlier, since early last year, we have raised our policy rate by five and a quarter percentage points, and we have decreased our securities holdings by more than $1 trillion. Our restrictive stance of monetary policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. The committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. We are committed to achieving a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation sustainably down to two percent over time and to keeping policy restrictive until we are confident that inflation is on a path to that objective. We are attentive to recent data showing the resilience of economic growth and demand for labor, evidence of growth persistently above potential, or that tightness in the labor market is no longer easing, could put further progress on inflation at risk and could warrant further tightening of monetary policy. Financial conditions have tightened significantly in recent months, driven by higher longer-term bond yields, among other factors. Because persistent changes in financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy, we monitor financial developments closely. In light of the uncertainties and risks and how far we have come, the committee is proceeding carefully. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of the incoming data and their implications for the outlook and for economic activity and inflation, as well as the balance of risks. In determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2 percent over time, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal and to keeping longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below potential growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission we at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Let's go to Howard. Uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Powell, for doing this. Uh, to what you referenced the, the rise in long-term bond yields, to what degree did that supplant uh, action by the Fed at this meeting? Thanks for your question. So. Um, 
I'll talk about bond yields, but I, I want to take a second and just sort of set the broader context in which we're, we're looking at that. So if you, if you look at the situation, let's look at the economy first. Inflation has been coming down, but it's still running well above our 2% target. The labor market has been rebalancing, but it's still very tight by many measures. GDP growth has been strong, although many forecasters are forecasting, and they have been forecasting, that it will slow. As for the committee, we are committed to achieving a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2 percent over time. And we're not confident yet that we have achieved such a stance. So that is the broader context in, into which this — the strong economy and all the things I said, that's the context in which we're looking at this question uh, of rates. So um, obviously, we're, we're monitoring, we're attentive to the increase in longer-term yields, and which have contributed to uh, a tightening of broader financial conditions since the summer. As I mentioned, persistent changes in broader financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy. In this case, the tighter financial conditions we're seeing from higher long-term rates, but also from other sources like uh, the stronger dollar and, and lower equity prices could matter for future rate decisions as long as two, two conditions are satisfied. The first is that the tighter conditions would need to be persistent, and uh, that is something that remains to be seen. Um, but, but that's critical. We're, you know, if things are fluctuating back and forth, that's not what we're looking for. With financial conditions, we're looking for persistent changes that are material. The second thing is that, that, that the, the longer-term rates that have moved up, they can't simply be a reflection of, of expected policy moves from us. Uh, that we would then — that if we didn't follow through on them, then, then, the, then the rates would come back down. So the — and I would say on that, it does not appear that an expectation of higher near-term policy rates is causing the increase in longer-term rates. So um, in the meantime, though, uh, perhaps the most important thing is that these higher Treasury yields are showing through to higher borrowing costs for households and businesses, and those higher costs are going to weigh on economic activity to the extent this tightening persists. And, you know, the, the mind's eye goes to the 8 percent, near 8 percent uh, mortgage rate, which, which could have, you know, pretty significant effect on housing. So that's how I would answer your question. Just as a quick follow on to be clear on this, um, in your opening statement and just now, I, I, you, you seem to imply that you are not yet confident that financial conditions are restrictive enough to, to finish the fight. Is that true? Yes, that's exactly right. Um, you know, to say it a different way, we haven't made any decisions about, about future meetings. Um, we have not made a determination, uh, and we're not — I will say that we're, we're not confident at this time that we've reached such a stance. We're not confident that we haven't, but we're not confident that we have. And that's — that is, is — the way we're going to be going into these future meetings is to be, you know, just determining the extent of any additional further policy uh, tightening that, that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2 percent over time. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you so much for taking our questions. I wonder, you know, if you don't raise interest rates in December, would the presumption be that at that point that we should expect that rates are at their peak, or is there a possibility of restarting rate increases next year? And are there any costs to taking a more extended pause? So um, let me start by saying we haven't made a decision about September. You're asking a, a hypothetical there. But, but we're, we're going into this summer meeting. We'll get as you know, two more inflation readings, two more uh, labor market readings, some data on, uh, on economic activity. Uh, and so we'll be taking — and also the broader situation, the broader financial conditions situation and, and the broader world situation. We'll be looking at all those things as we make a decision in December. We haven't made that decision. I would say, though, that, that uh, the idea that if you the, — the idea that you wouldn't — would be would difficult to, to raise again after stopping for a meeting or two is just not right. I mean, the committee will always do what it, what it thinks is appropriate at the time. And again, we haven't made any decisions about — at all about December. We didn't even — we didn't talk about making a decision in December today. Really, it was a decision for this meeting and, and understanding broader things. Nick Timoros of The Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Powell, did the Fed staff put a recession back into the baseline forecast uh, in the materials for today's meeting? And how much does this tightening in financial conditions substitute for rate hikes if 
the tightening is persistent. You had said it was worth maybe a quarter point when we had the bank failures in the spring. What is it here on something that's presumably more straightforward and more familiar to simulate? So I guess uh, I don't want to answer your question about the um, about the recession, but the answer is no. I think I have to answer it since we since we did uh, publicly say in the minutes. You'll you'll know anyway in the minutes. The, the staff did not put our, our session back in. Uh, I mean, it would be hard to see how you would do that if you look at the um, look at the activity we've seen recently, uh, which is not really indicative of, of a recession in the near term. In terms of um, how to think about translation into uh, rate hikes, I think it's. It's just too early to be doing that. And the main reason is we just don't know how persistent this will be. You can see how volatile it is. Different kinds of news will affect the level of rates. And I think any kind of an estimate that was you know, precise would hang out there and have a great chance of looking wrong very quickly. So I think what we can say is that financial conditions have, have clearly tightened. And you can see that in the rates that, that consumers and, house, and households and businesses are paying now. And over time, that will have an effect. We just don't know how persistent it's going to be, and, and it's tough to try to translate that in a way that I'd be comfortable communicating into uh, how many rate hikes that is. If I could follow up, I guess what makes you confident that tighter, what, what makes you confident that tighter financial conditions will slow above trend growth when 500 basis points of rate hikes, QT, and a minor banking crisis have not thus far? Well, I just that that's. Uh, uh, you know, the way our policy works is, and sometimes it works with lags, of course, which can be long and variable, but ultimately, if you, if you raise the, the, you know, raise interest rates, you do see uh, the, those effects, and you see those effects in the economy now. You see what's happening in the housing market. You're seeing that now. You're, you'll see, uh, if you look at surveys uh, of people, it's not a good time, they think, to buy durable goods of various kinds because rates are so high now. Uh, I mentioned again, we're, we're getting reports from housing that the effects of this, of this could be quite significant. But you're right, the, this has been a resilient economy, and it's, I think, been surprising in its resilience, and there are, there are a number of possible reasons why that may be. Um, our job is to, is, to, is to achieve maximum employment and price stability, and so we take the economy as it comes. It has been resilient, uh, so we just uh, we take it as it is. Thank you. Colby Smith with the Financial Times. In terms of the thresholds that you've laid out um, of what could warrant further tightening, um, the additional evidence of persistently above trend growth or some kind of reversal in the recent easing of labor market tightness, that seems to suggest something more powerful than just one more quarter point rate hike would be necessary. And I'm just curious if, if that's how the, the committee sees it. So we've identified those factors. Those those were not meant to be the only factors or a specific test that we're going to be applying with with some metrics behind it. Really, we're going to be looking at the broader picture, and you know what's happening with our progress to, toward the two percent inflation goal. Is the labor market continuing to broadly cool off and achieve a better balance? We'll be looking at that. You know, growth. We look at growth insofar as it, it has implications for our two mandate goals. We look at that. And we look at broader financial conditions. So we'll be looking at all of those things as we reach a judgment, uh, you know, whether we need to further tighten policy. And if we do reach that judgment, then we will further tighten policy. Okay. And, and just in terms of the tightening of financial conditions, if that is having some kind of offsetting um, effect in terms of the need to potentially, again, raise rates, what then is the potential impact on the trajectory of, of rate cuts? Could we see those maybe pulled forward or have to see um, more than, than what the September SEP indicated? So it's, it's the fact is the committee is not thinking about rate cuts right now at all. We're not talking about rate cuts. We're still very focused on the first question, which is, have we, re have we achieved a stance of monetary policy that's sufficiently restrictive to bring, in bring inflation down to 2% over time sustainably? That is the question we're focusing on. The next question, as you know, will be, for how long will we remain restrictive? Will policy remain restrictive? And what we said there is that we'll, we'll keep policy restrictive until we're confident that inflation is, is on a sustainable path down to 2%. That'll be the next question. But honestly, right now, we're really tightly focused on the first question. The question of rates cuts just, just doesn't come up because I think it, the, the first, it's so important to get that first question you know, as, as close to right as you can.
Steve Leisman, CNBC. Mr. Chairman, I guess I had assumed that there was a tightening bias in the committee. You say in the statement you're looking to assess the appropriate stance of monetary policy, uh, the extent to which uh, you may you may need to hike additionally. You you didn't say earlier that you were sufficiently restrictive. There were forecasts for two rate hikes among most members of the committee, but then you just said that. You know, we're, we don't, we haven't made a determination. Would you say the bias right now is neutral, that there is no disposition to hike again, and that the committee largely has moved off of this forecast for two hikes? Or for, I'm sorry, one additional I hike? I think you're talking about one additional. Yeah, no, I, no I, I wouldn't say that at all. I would say, I mean, the, the language, you know, looking at it here, uh, in determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation 2% over time, that's the question we're asking. So, so is it right to think of that as a, a hiking bias is still in the committee here? We haven't used that term, but y y it's fair to say that's the question we're asking is should we hike more? It's not, it's not uh, you know, and that, that, that is the question, and you're right, that it, in September we wrote down one additional rate hike, but, you know, we'll, we'll write down another forecast, as you know, in December. Chris. Uh, thank you. Chris Rugaber at Associated Press. Um, well, since the last meeting, the auto workers' strike has finished. Uh, oil prices have leveled off. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, you have the outbreak of war between uh, Israel and Hamas. How do you see all those factors taken together affecting the economy uh, going forward? How are you thinking about those? Um, so there, there are significant issues out there. As you, as you point out, um, global uh, geopolitical tensions are certainly elevated. And that goes for the war in Ukraine. It goes for the war between Israel and Hamas. Uh, we're monitoring that. Our job is to monitor those things for their economic uh, implications. Um, so the UAW strike, as you point out, is, is um, uh, appears to be coming to an end. Oil prices have flattened out. They haven't gone down, but I guess they've gone down a little bit from their earlier peak. Um, another one is the, the possibility of government shutdown. We don't know about that one. So there's plenty of, of risk out there. Um, but I, I would go back to the, you know, the bigger picture for, from our standpoint is, is we've got a very strong economy, strong labor market, making progress on the labor market, making progress on inflation, and um, we're very focused on f uh, getting confident that we have achieved a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive. That's really our focus. Great. Just one quick thing. You uh, last month had gone to York, Pennsylvania, where you talked to a lot of, or yeah, last month, where you talked to a lot of small business owners. Just curious, what sentiments did you hear from them, or what did you pick up on, and what would you was there anything that surprised you the most in terms of what they talked about? I wouldn't say I was terribly surprised. I was I was very impressed by uh, York as a town with a real strategy, and I would say it's uh, it's very impressive what the people there uh, have have put together. Uh, in the face of you know some difficult longer run trends about offshoring of manufacturing and that kind of thing, they've they've done a, a great job as a as a city. I think, you know, what you hear and it is c consistent there, which is people are really suffering under high inflation. You were there. We talked to some people who, you know, were feeling that in their businesses and other people who were feeling it in their home lives as well. You know, it's it's painful for people, particularly people who. You know, who don't have a lot of extra financial resources, who are spending most of their incoming, uh, you know, income on uh, the, the essentials of life. So we know that it, that that wasn't new, but that did come through very clearly uh, in 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 the conversations we had in New York. And you know, I, I walked away from that and even, you know, I mean, just thinking that that we really the the best thing we can do for the U.S. is to restore price stability. Uh, fully restore price stability and not fail in that task and do it as quickly as possible, but but also with the least damage we we can. Rachel. Hi, Chair Powell. Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. You've spoken before about the pain that would likely be coming for the economy in order to get inflation down. But since the economy has not responded to rate hikes in ways that would normally be expected, have you changed your views on that at all, on how necessary or inevitable that kind of pain would be, say, for the labor market or overall growth? Well, I think everyone has been very gratified to see that we've been able to achieve you know, pretty significant progress on inflation without seeing the kind of increase in unemployment that has been 
very typical of rate hiking cycles like this one. So that's that's a historically unusual and and very welcome result. And the same is true of growth. You know, we've we've been saying that we need to see below potential growth, and growth has been strong, but yet we're still seeing this. I think I still believe, and my colleagues, for the most part, I think still believe that it is likely to be true. It is still likely to be true, not a certainty, but likely that we will need to see some slower growth and some softening in the labor market, in labor market conditions to get, to, you know, to, to fully restore price stability. So, but it's, a, it's only a good thing that we haven't seen, and I think we know why. <clears throat> you know, since, since we lifted off, we've, we have understood that there are really two processes at work here, one of, them, one of which is the unwinding of the distortions to both supply and demand from the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. And the other is, is you know, restrictive monetary policy, which is moderating demand and giving the supply side time to, time to recover, time and space to recover. So you see those two forces now working together to bring down inflation. But it's that, that first one can bring down inflation without the need for higher unemployment or slower growth. It's just, it's supply, you know, supply side improvements like um, shortages and bottlenecks and that kind of thing going away. It's getting, you know, a significant increase in the size of the labor market now, both from labor force participation and from immigration. That's a big supply side, uh, you know, gain that is really helping the economy. And it's part of why, part of why GDP is so high is because we're getting that, that supply. So we welcome that. Um, but I think those things will run their course and we're probably still gonna be left, we think and I think, we'll still be left with, a, with some ground to cover to get back to full price stability. And, and that's where monetary policy and, and what we do in, with demand is, is still gonna be important. Against that backdrop, if you've gotten any clarity <clears throat> on lags, if you have an economy that's been so resilient to high rate increases, does that suggest to you that there isn't necessarily this huge wave of tightening that's still coming through the pipeline and that it may have already come into effect? You know, I, I continue to think it's very hard to say. So it's, it's been one year at this meeting. Uh, one year ago, this was the fourth of our 75 basis points hike, hikes. So that's a full year since then. I think we are seeing the effects of, of all the hiking we did last year, and, and this year we're seeing it. It's very hard to know exactly what that might be. But you can, for example, an, an example of where, where you wouldn't have felt this yet is, is debt that had been termed out. Uh, it, but it's going to come due and have to get rolled over next year or the year after. So, and there are little things like that where the effects are just taking time to get into the economy. So I don't, uh, I, th I think we have to make monetary policy under great uncertainty about how long the lags are. I think trying to make a clear, get a clear answer and say, oh, I'm just going to assume this is really not a good way to do it. And this is one of the reasons why we have slowed the process down this year, was to give monetary policy time to get into the economy. And it takes time, we know that, and you can't rush it. So doing slowing down is giving us, I think, a better sense of, of how much more we need to do if we need to do more. Michael McKee from uh, Bloomberg Television and Radio. Um, I'm trying to connect the dots here. Um, one quick clarification I want to ask uh, about um, Rachel's question is you said you need slower growth. You had always said before a period of lower uh, than trend growth. Uh, has that changed? And two, it sounds to me like uh, you're basically saying here that the kind of the dot plots out the window, that every meeting is live with the possibility of a rate increase for right now, doesn't matter about the turn of the, uh, the year, and that there's not an objective way to determine whether or not you've got enough uh, tightening in the system. It's uh, just going to be a sub subjective judgment meeting by meeting. Well, so let's talk about the dot plot first. So the dot plot is a is a, <clears throat> a picture in time of what the people on the committee thinks is likely to be a mo appropriate monetary policy in light of their own personal economic forecast. In principle, when things change, it's not that's not like a plan that anybody's agreed to or that we will do. That's a forecast that would change, for example. I mean, many things could change that would cause people to say, I wouldn't write down that dot, you know, six weeks later. Think of the number of things that could change your mind on that. So I think, I think the, the efficacy of the dot plot probably decays over the three-month period 
between that meeting and the next meeting. But nonetheless, it's, it's out there, and we don't. We, we do personally ad, uh, update our forecast, but we don't formally update the dot plot. So, you know, I, I think we try to be as transparent as we can about the way we're thinking about these things. We, we're, we're laying out there our thinking, and you know, as we approach the meeting, we'll, we'll all, be, you know, my colleagues and I will be talking about how we're processing that data. In terms of, <clears throat> so I, I, we're not really changing the way. In terms of. Uh, growth, uh, what I said was below potential. So what, what you have here recently is growth that is, that is um, temporarily, potential growth is elevated for a year or two right now over its trend level. So the right way to think about it is what's potential growth this year. Our trend, people think trend growth over a long period of time is a little bit less than 2 percent or I would say just around 2 percent. But um, what we've had is, with with the you know improvement in the size of the labor force, as I mentioned, through both participation and uh, immigration, and with the, the you know the better functioning in the labor market, and with with uh, the, you know the unwinding of the supply chain and shortages and those kinds of things, you're seeing actually elevated potential growth. There's catch up growth that can happen in potential, and that means that if you're grow you could be growing at two percent this year and still be going, growing below the increase in the potential output of the economy. I hope that's clear. That's really what's going on. That's, that's why I would say it as below potential. But if you could uh, <clears throat> clarify what I asked about the uh, meeting by meeting, are we essentially now supposed to assume that it's a meeting by meeting, live meeting with a chance of a rate increase that will be decided on uh, subjective uh, criteria rather than objective at each meeting? I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I want to just accept anybody's characterization of it. I'll, I'll tell you how we're doing this. So <clears throat> we're going meeting by meeting. We're asking ourselves whether we've achieved a stance of policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time. That's the question we're asking. We're looking at the full range of economic data, including financial conditions and all of those things that we look at, and then we're, we're you know, we, we've, we've, we've come very far with this rate hiking cycle, very far. And you saw the spread at, in, at the September meeting of, you know, it's a relatively small spread of people think one or two additional hikes, so you're close to the, to the end of the cycle. That's, that was an impression as of, a belief as of September. It's not a promise or a plan of the future. And so we're going into these meetings one by one. We're looking at the data. As I mentioned, we're also, you know, we've, we're, being, we're being careful. We're proceeding carefully because we can proceed carefully at this time. Monetary policy is restrictive. We see its effects, uh, particularly in interest-sensitive interest spending and other channels. So that's how I think about it. <clears throat> Neil. Thanks. Uh, hi, Chair Powell. Neil Irwin with Axios. Um, in light of the run-up in long-term yields we've seen the last several weeks, uh, have you given any consideration to the pace of your asset runoff program? Uh, and if there were a judgment that, higher, that the uh, higher-term premium was endangering the dual mandate goals, would that be reason to think about slowing or suspending QT, or should we think of that as more of a technical question around reserves? So committee is not considering uh, changing the pace of balance sheet runoff. It's not something we're talking about or considering. Um, and I know there are, there are many candidate explanations for why rates have been going up, uh, and QT is certainly on that list. It may be playing a relatively small effect, although I would say at $3.3 trillion in reserves, it's not, I, think, I think it's hard to make a case that reserves are even close to scarce at this point. So that's not something that we're, that we're looking at right now. <clears throat> Victoria. Hi, uh, Victoria Guido with Politico. Uh, I wanted to ask about the Basel III uh, endgame capital proposal. Uh, you know, you've gotten a lot of pushback from people on different aspects of the proposal, and you yourself expressed some reservations. And I'm just curious, um, could you accept finalizing that proposal without significant changes? So that proposal is out for comment, and uh, we expect a lot of comment. We won't get those comments until the end of, uh, well, until well into next year. You know, we've extended the, the deadline. And we'll take them seriously. We'll read them. Well, I, I'll say what, what I do expect is that we will, we will come to, a, we're a consensus-driven organization, we'll come to a package that, that has broad support on the board. So does broad support mean more support than the proposal had? It means broad support. Janelle Marte with Bloomberg. 
So um, in addition to persistence, when you look at long-term treasury yields, what else are you watching to evaluate how those tighter financial conditions are hitting the economy and if it will lessen the need for further tightening? Also, do you think that those higher yields could affect um, banking stress? So what do we look at? <clears throat> we look at a very wide range of financial conditions. And in fact, as, as you'll know, uh, uh, different organizations publish different financial conditions indexes, which can have you know seven or eight variables, or they can have a hundred variables. So there's a there's a very rich environment, and we, we tend to look at a few of them. I'm not going to give you the names, but there you know there are a few of the common ones that people look at, and so they're looking at things like the level of the dollar, the level of equity prices, uh, the level of rates, the credit spreads. Sometimes uh, they're, they're pulling in credit availability and things like that. So it isn't any one thing. We, we would never look at, for example, long-term treasury rates in isolation, uh, nor will we ignore them. But we, we would look at them as, bro as part of a broader picture. And they do play a role, of course, in, in many uh, of the major standard uh, financial condition indexes. Your second question was? Uh, banking stress. So it's something we're watching. As you know, we, we did have, um, there were issues with interest rate risk uh, and also, um, you know, uh, funding uninsured deposits uh, in, in the March, the things we went through in March and thereafter. And so we've been working a lot with financial institutions to make sure that they have uh, good funding plans and good, and, uh, and that they have a plan for how to deal with, with um, you know, the kind of portfolio uh, unrealized losses that they have. We do think the banking system is is quite resilient. We we had you know a handful of bank failures, but uh, so that's that's what we're out there doing, and um, we don't have any reason to think that this that these right hikes uh, are materially changing that picture, which is one of a strong banking system and one where there's a, a strong focus by banks and by supervisors on liquidity, on funding, and, and those sorts of things. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Scott Horsley from NPR. Last week, you and your colleagues put forward a proposal to lower the cap on debit card swipe fees for, for comment. Could you just talk a little bit about uh, the considerations there, what it would mean for merchants, for banks, for consumers, and also just what y'all are seeing in terms of the use of both debit and credit cards in the, in the payment system? You know, <clears throat> so you're right. We, we, we put a proposal out for comment is what we did. And you know this is this is a job that Congress assigned us, as you, as you of course know, uh, in Dodd Frank. And all we can really do is faithfully implement the statute. That's that's all we're trying to do. What else can we really do? Um, it's a 90-day comment period. Uh, we typically don't comment on these things once they're out for out for comment. And we do hope that stakeholders, and we know that they will use this opportunity to express their views. They haven't been shy about that. So that's that's critical, and that's that's what I can say about that now. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Edward Lawrence with Fox Business. So over the last um, three months, the year-over-year -year PC inflation was at 3.4 percent, core well over 3 percent. You've said in the past 2 percent remains the Federal Reserve target, but with no rate increase today, how long would you be okay then with a 3 percent or 3 percent plus overall inflation? You know, the, <clears throat> the progress is probably going to come in lumps and be bumpy, but we're making progress. You know, I think, I think the core PCE came down by almost 60 basis points in the third quarter. So if you, I, the best thing I could point to you to would be the um, September SEP, where uh, you know, the expectation was that, that inflation by the end of next year on a 12-month 12, 12 trailing basis would be well into the twos, and the year after that, further into the twos. So that's, that's, if you look historically, that's, that's sort of consistent with the way inflation comes down. It does take some time. And as you get, you know, as, as you get uh, further and further from those highs, it may actually take longer time. But the good, good news is we're, you know, we're making progress and monetary policy is restrictive and we feel like we're on a path uh, to make more progress and it's essential that we do. Well, you said in the past that doing too little on interest <clears throat> rates could take years to fix, but the cost of doing too much could be easily fixed. How robust was the debate about this pause on the doing too little side? That's always the, the question we're asking ourselves. And um, we know that if we, if we fail to restore price stability, the risk is that 
expectations of higher inflation get entrenched in the economy. And we know that that's really bad for people. Inflation will be both more high, uh, both higher and more volatile. That's that's a prescription for misery, and and so um, we're really committed to not letting that happen. Um, you know, for the first year or so of our tightening cycle, the risk was all on the side of not doing enough. We're you know we're we've come far enough that that the risks are, you know have gotten more two-sided. You can't identify that with a lot of precision, but it does feel like the, the risks are, are more two-sided now. Um, and, um, but we're, we're committed to getting inflation back down to our target over time, and we will. Uh, Simon Urbinovich with The Economist. Um, quick follow-up to the question about banking stresses. Uh, you talked about how the banking system is resilient. Uh, of course, part of the resilience of the past year stems from the, the bank term funding program that you launched in March. Um, given that bond prices have not recovered, that unrealized losses are probably mounting, how likely is it that you might have to extend that program uh, in March next year? Um, good question. We're, we, haven't really, we haven't really been thinking about that yet. We. Uh, um, you know, it's it's November one, and that's a decision we'll be making in the first quarter of next year. Okay. Um, sorry. Quick separate question about uh, inflation expectations. The U uh, Michigan <coughs> sentiment survey showed a big jump in one year ahead inflation expectations last month from three point two to four point two. Last year, you said that particular survey was a really decisive factor in one of your rate hike decisions. Uh, if it stays elevated uh, next time around, how big of an input will that be into your December thinking? Yeah, we we look at a. A range of, of things. Uh, I, I think the, the the you know the UM thing got blown out of proportion a little bit. It was actually a preliminary estimate that got revised away, and and I said it was preliminary in that, but that didn't get picked up. So uh, we we look at many many things, and so really look across the broad array of surveys and also market based estimates, and you know and we do that really carefully at every meeting and between meetings, and you know there, there's it's just clear that inflation expectations are in a good place, the public does believe that, that inflation will get back down to 2% over time, and, uh, and it will. They're right. So, uh, and, and there's no real crack in that, in that uh, armor. You can always find one reading that is a little bit out of whack, uh, but, but honestly, the bulk of them are, are just very clear that, that uh, the public believes that inflation will come down. And that's, of course, we, we believe that's critical in winning the battle. Hi, Chair Powell. Megan Casella with Barron's. Thanks for taking our questions. I wanted to see if you could talk about the neutral rate. You mentioned today that you're still debating whether rates are sufficiently restrictive. And you've recently said that um, evidence is suggesting policy is not too tight right now. So I was curious if you could elaborate on that at all and whether that means the neutral rate, in your view, has risen. Yeah. Um, so first thing to say is that it's very important. It's a very important variable in, in the way we think about monetary policy, but you can't identify it with any precision in real time. And we know that. So you have to just take that, you have to take your estimate of it with a grain of salt. Um, what we know now is, you know, within a range of estimates of the neutral rate, policy is, is, uh, is restrictive. Uh, and it's therefore putting downward pressure on economic activity, hiring and inflation. So we do we do talk about this. There's we're, there's not any debate or you know attempt to you know f to sort of agree as a group on what whether our star has moved or not. Some people think it has. Some people haven't said that don't think it has. Ultimately, it's it's unknowable. And so really, again, what we're focused on is you know looking at the data and giving ourselves a little more time now to look carefully at the data <clears throat> by being careful in our, in our moves, does it, does it feel like monetary policy is restrictive enough to bring inflation down to 2% over time? That's the question we're asking ourselves. Um, I, I think, you know, years from now, economists will be revising their estimates of, of R star as it existed on November 1, 2023. You can't, we can't really wait for that in making policy. We have to Look, we have to we have to have those models and look at them and think about them. But ultimately, we've got to look at the effects of po that policies having, accounting for the lags, which makes it difficult. 
If I could follow up on a wages point earlier, you talked about the inflation outlook, but I'm curious if you have any concerns whether wage inflation um, at its current level could be could risk pushing up overall inflation or reacceleration. So if you look at the look at the broad range of wages. Um, they have all the in, wage increases have really come down significantly over the course of the last 18 months to a level where they're substantially closer to that level that would be consistent with 2% inflation over time, making standard assumptions about productivity over time. So it's much closer than it was. Uh, and that's true of uh, the ECI, which is a, the one that's the one that we, we got this week. It's true of. Um, average hourly earnings and compensation per hour, too. So, And all of them are kind of saying that, which is great. And you have to look at a group of them, because any one of them can be idiosyncratic from at, in any given reading. So that's what you see. Uh, and so what you saw with the ECI reading was, if you look if you look back a couple, it comes out four times a year. If you look back a couple of quarters, you'll see it was much higher. And then it came down substantially in June. And then the September reading was more or less at the same level as the June reading. So in a way, it's just validating that decline. And it was very close to our expectations internally, too. So I think we feel good about that. Also, I would say it, it isn't, in my thinking, it's not the case that, that wages have been the principal driver of inflation um, so far. Although I, I, think it's all, I do think it's fair to say that as we go forward, as monetary policy becomes more important relative to the supply side issues I talked about and the unwinding of the pandemic effects, it may be that, that the, the labor market is, becomes more important over time, too. Nancy. Hi, Nancy Marshall Genser <clears throat> with Marketplace. Um, Chair Paul, are you now as concerned about overshooting and raising interest rates too much as you are about getting inflation down to the 2% target? So I, I, as I mentioned, um, I think for much of the last year and a half, the concern was not doing too much, too, too, not doing enough. It was not getting rates high enough in time to avoid having inflation expectations, higher inflation expectations, become entrenched. So that was the concern. I think we've reached a, a you know now more than 18 months into this. You can see by the fact that we have slowed down, although that we're still we're still we're still trying to gain confidence in in what the appropriate stance is. But you can see that um, we think, and I think, that the risks are, are getting more balanced. I'll just say that they're getting more balanced. The risk of doing too much versus the risk of doing too little are getting are getting cl more closer to balance because policy is clear. I think clearly restrictive at five and a quarter to five and a half percent. That that range. You're, if you, you take off a, a mainstream estimate of the, of the uh, expected inflation, take one-year inflation, you're going to see that you're going to see a, a real policy rate that is, you know, well above mainstream estimates of, of a neutral policy rate. Now that's that's arithmetic. It doesn't really. It, what, what the proof is really in how the economy reacts. But I, I would say that we're we're in a place where where those risks are getting closer to being in balance. And you said the proof is how the economy reacts. What are you looking at to be sure you're not overshooting? Well, I think <clears throat> what we're looking at is are, are we still, is inflation still broadly cooling? Do we, is it sort of validating the, the, the path we saw over the summer uh, where inflation was clearly cooling and coming down? Now, we've seen periods like that before, and they've just, that there hasn't been follow through the data have bounced back. So what are we seeing? You know, are we, are we seeing is inflation still coming down? So that's the, the first thing. Second thing is in the labor market, um, what we've seen is a, a very positive rebalancing of supply and demand, partly through just much more supply coming online. And, and with, with labor demand still clearly remaining very strong when, you're, when, when you have the kind of job growth we've had over the last quarter. It's still very strong demand. So, and you see wage increases coming down as we, we discussed, but coming out, coming down, you know, in a kind of gradual way. Um, I think that's what we want to see that that whole set of processes continue. Brian, thank you, Brian Mena, CNN. Um, 
do you think that there has been any structural change in either consumption or in the job market that's uh, pushing up consumption? Uh, you obviously saw the third quarter GDP figures, which were strong, and some economists have expected revenge spending to have fizzled out by now. So I'm kind of wondering if, uh, if there's been any structural change in consumption. Um. I wouldn't say there's been a structural change in consumption. I would say it's certainly um, been strong. And so a couple of things. We may have underestimated the, the balance sheet strength of households and small businesses, and that may be part of it. Um, there may be, you know, we've been, like everyone else, trying to estimate the number of the amount of savings that, that, uh, that households have from the pandemic when they couldn't spend on services really at all, <clears throat> or, or, you know, in-person services. And, you know, there can still be more of that than we think, although at a certain point we have to, we're going to be getting back to pre-pandemic levels of savings. We may not be there yet. So things are, for clearly people are still spending. The dynamic has been really strong job creation with now wages that are, that are higher than inflation, in the aggregate anyway, and that raises real disposable income. And that raises spending, which continues to drive more hiring. And so you've had a really, that, that, whole, that whole dynamic has been, <clears throat> and also at the same time, um, the pandemic effects are wearing off so that goods availability, automobile availability is better or was better. I think it still is. And, they're, and from, a, from a business standpoint, there are more people to hire. And you know, there's more labor supply. So the whole thing has led to more growth, more spending, and that kind of thing. And it's been, you know, it's been good. And, and the thing is, we've been achieving progress on inflation in the middle of this. So um, it's been a, a dynamic. The question is, how long can that continue? And, you know, I just think th this, th th the existence of this second set of factors at this time, which is the unwinding of the pandemic effects, that's what makes this cycle uh, unique, I think. And, you know, we're still learning. Uh, so it, that that took longer for that pro process to begin than we thought, and we're still learning about how it plays out. That's that's all we can do. So, to Daniel, <coughs> the last question. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, Daniel Avis from uh, Agence France Press. Um, just a quick question, following up uh, on an earlier one. Um, uh, with regards to the Israel-Hamas uh, conflict, um, you know, uh, the Fed's financial stability report said the Israel-Hamas conflict and the conflict in Ukraine pose important risks to global economic activity, including the possibility of sustained disruptions to regional trade in food, energy, and other commodities. You've had organizations like the World Bank warning of a possible uh, you know, surge in oil prices if the war uh, spreads <coughs> to other countries in the region. I'm just wondering how the Fed is monitoring these developments in the Middle East. You mentioned they are. And, and, and just what you know, the potential economic impact could be if the conflict does spread to other countries in the region. Thank you. Uh, I wouldn't want to speculate too much, but I'll just say so, you know, really the question there is, does the war spread more widely and does it start to do things like affect oil prices in particular, since this is the Middle East we're talking about? <clears throat> the price of oil has really not reacted very much so far to this. As, you know, as the Fed, as, as the, the Federal Open Market Committee, our job is really to talk about to understand the economy and the economic effects. And it's, it isn't clear at this point that the conflict in the Middle East is going to is on track to have significant economic effects. That doesn't mean it isn't incredibly important and something for people to, uh, you know, to take take great really important notice of. But it may or may not turn out to be something that matters for the Federal Open Market Committee as an economic body. But the, what the, so what the Financial Stability Report does is it calls out risks. And that's what it's doing is calling out a risk of that. And the war in Ukraine, the same. The war in Ukraine you know, did have immediately very significant macroeconomic implications because of the connection to commodities. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was Fed Chair Jay Powell speaking for almost an hour, for 50 minutes. This is the Fed Decides on Bloomberg Television, on Bloomberg Radio. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, John, off today. And really, I've got to just go straight to the markets. What the, what the Fed said is we don't have any decisions about any further uh, rate hikes. 
what the market hurt is, you're done. And you can see a rally in bonds. You're seeing a rally in stocks extending to uh, session highs on the S&P, up more than 1%. The Nasdaq gains of 1.6%. The two-year yield firmly below 5%, Tom. That caught my attention at a time when the Fed is trying to parse through nuance and the market only hears one thing. The moves are so correlated and so abrupt, including oil, West Texas Intermediate, almost getting down to a 79 handle, which the chairman alluded to in the final question on the war in the eastern Mediterranean. But in the bond market, Lisa, what's so important here is these moves are so large, I have to go to a standard deviation analysis. Conventional financial TV doesn't capture the magnitude of the vote you're seeing. David Rosenberg, always brilliant out of Toronto, making clear this is a Fed that is done, and yet the singular point was Leisman of CNBC and McKee of Bloomberg, where he stopped in the middle of his conversation to say, we still Stand ready to be hawkish against this entire arc of we're done. Cue whether or not they've lost some credibility because he could say we're prepared to hike again. We've made no decisions. We're going to have a consensus on the Federal Reserve. The market, again, really is starting to price out further rate hikes more materially. I will just say this. In terms of whether the market is doing the work for them, he speculated that it was really persistent changes in financial conditions, and it's too soon to say. Uh -huh. Everything was hedged. Everything was going yes. back to the notes. Yes. Everything was very rote. He did uh, as much as he could to say as little as possible. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. And I like the idea that everything was hedged in the sense of we didn't hear data dependency much, which surprised me. I thought we'd say, OK, the jobs report, maybe we finally see a crack in an economy coming off 4.x percent real GDP. I, I think that that this was taken by the markets, which is really what I would focus on. The Dow up 250 points, 1.6 percent. Move Nasdaq at 117 basis points of soft landing in the 10-year yield. The market is speaking volumes. They loved what they heard. Well, and this is going to, of course, be due to revision with time. And we've known that the knee-jerk reaction is not always the one that sticks. But, Tom, to me, the fact that the market is jumping on this and that earlier in the day you saw yields tick lower because of their funding announcement, then even lower, particularly on the long end, after economic data that came in weaker than expected, and then Chair Powell coming in and pushing them that much further lower as people expect them to be done. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, to say the least. We'll continue to monitor the markets, and we have a stellar group of people to drive the conversation forward. Let's drive the conversation forward right now, almost quoting off Star Wars. He was very far, very far away. A question from uh, Michael McKee. Let us listen to the chairman here on what is out there. We're going meeting by meeting. We're asking ourselves whether we've achieved a stance of policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2 percent over time. That's the question we're asking. We're looking at the full range of economic data, including financial conditions and all of those things that we look at. And then we're, we're you know, we, we've, we've, we've come very far with this rate hiking cycle, very far. Who nailed this, the very far of it, was William Dudley, out of Berkeley for years, of course, at Goldman Sachs and the former New York Federal Reserve president, huge value at Bloomberg Economics and a senior advisor in economics for all of Bloomberg. Uh, Bill Dudley, you and I were in the lofty, cool climbs of Marrakesh a few weeks ago as the international community confronted a unique American experiment, a dynamic fiscal inducement, a fiscal stimulus to where we are now. Your essay in the last two hours for Bloomberg makes clear you have immense concern that the Fed, given the cards dealt, could get this wrong. What did the chairman not address in this press conference? I think that he's quite confident that policy is restrictive enough to slow the economy down. And I think the fact that we just had a growth quarter of nearly 5 percent uh, calls that a bit into question. Also, the notion that financial conditions are truly tight to slow, enough to slow the economy down, I think, is also uh, pretty questionable. Because if you look at most financial condition indexes, the, chief, the, the, the biggest impulse towards restraint really happened last year. Uh, not not right now. So I think
think that, you know, maybe they have done enough, maybe they haven't. But I think one reason why markets are hearing this so confidently is he feels very confident the Fed has done a lot. He feels policy is restrictive. And so I think, you know, the market is taking away the notion that he thinks he's done. Uh, and obviously, you know, that depends on how the economy evolves, what happens to inflation, what happens to the labor market. And, this, and the other thing that the market's taking a lot of uh, a positive signal from is he talked about how all these pandem pandemic effects are, 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 are washing out now in a good way. So the labor market is becoming much more in balance. Uh, labor force growth has picked up. It's, it's a very benign story about how this is all played out. It's basically a story where the Fed really hasn't had to do that much to bring inflation down, and the Fed basically is saying, we don't think we're going to have to do much more from here. Chair Powell also didn't seem to think that there was any casualty in pausing, letting time go on, and then restarting rate hikes. He said that that wasn't problematic at all. Do you disagree? Obviously, if it turns out that they, they, they need to do more, they're probably going to have to do more than just one quarter point move. You know, if you've taken a break for, let's say, six months and the evidence accumulates that monetary policy is not as tight as you think it is and inflation expectations are starting to become unanchored, labor market's not loosening, wages are stuck at, you know, four and a half percent, then it's unlikely that one quarter point move is just going to be sufficient to do the job. So I think it's either zero or multiple rate hikes. Which is a reason why I, I probably some people are looking at this like yourself and saying they could be on the brink of an error. There was a question about how financial conditions really played into the Fed's decision, whether higher yields were doing their work. He had some nuance around this, talking about a sustained move higher. Take a listen to Chair Powell speaking on the issue. Persistent changes in broader financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy. In this case, the tighter financial conditions we're seeing from higher long-term rates, but also from other sources like the stronger dollar and, and lower equity prices could matter for future rate decisions. With financial conditions, we're looking for persistent changes that are material. Bill Dudley, from your vantage point, does this give any clarity as to how the Fed is counting yields in their uh, picture of what restrictive really looks like? Well, I think I agree with him that persistence is what matters. I mean, if bond yields go up for a week or two and then come right back down, that's not going to exert much restraint on the economy. You know, one problem I think the chairman has at this point is by talking to the markets in a sort of supportive way, uh, stocks rally, bond yields fall. That's loosening financial conditions, and so that's removing some of the restraint uh, that was creating some uh, impetus for not tightening monetary policy further. The heart of the matter to me, Bill, and I don't want to turn this into a Dale Jorgensen's through three ratio course, and Julia Coronado's been brilliant on this as well. So let's listen to Dr. Coronado and Dr. Dudley, folks. And Bill Dudley said, barring unexpectedly fast productivity growth, there seems to be almost a hope and prayer, Bill Dudley, that this time is different and instantly we have a new elevated productivity. Do you see any signal of this in post pandemic? America? I think it's really too soon to make any decisions about productivity at all. Productivity growth took a real hit during the pandemic and then it picked up as we reopened. Uh, the, what, what, what the trend is at this point is very, very uncertain. And, and you notice that Chair Powell did not talk about productivity yes. growth as that, that trend, trend changing. What he talked about was the labor force growth had picked up a lot because labor force participation uh, among you know adult workers has, has, has climbed a lot and immigration right. had picked up. So he saw, so he saw that as a positive supply side uh, surprise. Uh, but I don't think that the Fed or, yeah. or, 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 or I, for that matter, think that there is a productivity growth miracle uh, uh, right, right around the corner. Bill Dudley, it's Wednesday. We're going to a jobs report on Friday. Let's go back to Dudley and McKelvey at Goldman Sachs a few years ago. What's an appropriate non-farm payroll statistic, not on Friday, but say three months moving average out, where you can say all clear and finally we have a labor economy settling down? Is it sub 100,000? Yeah, it's probably in that in that ballpark. I mean, as Chair Powell said, we are getting a surge in the labor force this year, but I think he also expects that that will peter out over time. And then you're just stuck with the growth rate of the working age population, uh, which is probably only growing at about a half a percent a year. And so that's that's consistent with payroll gains of maybe 100,000 a month or even a little bit less. So I think that eventually the Fed needs to bring payroll growth below 100,000 if they're going to generate enough slack in the labor market to bring wage inflation down to levels uh, consistent with 
2% inflation. Given the volatility that we've seen in the bond market, Bill, how concerned are you about a real blowback on Friday? Should we get a jobs report that comes in materially hotter than expected and we continue to see those upside surprises that you say may pose the biggest risk? Well, I'm, I personally would not put too much attention on any one given uh, economic release at this point because the Fed has basically said we're, we are patient now. And so one uh, economic report is not going to change their thinking. It's only an accumulation of evidence that suggests the policy is not sufficiently restrictive to do the job, which will cause the Fed to start to tighten monetary policy again. So I think we need to you know, maybe downplay any single report at this point. Uh, it's going to take an accumulation of evidence for the Fed to decide that they need to do more on monetary policy. Bill Dudley, thank you so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate it this morning, folks. I'll send out the essay across all my social here. His op-ed is really must read. Some really good writing just in the last 24 hours from a number of uh, people within the zeitgeist. I need to do a market check here because this is an historic move. Uh, it was, see, I'm going to be as quick as I can, Lisa, as you go to Michael McKee. The Dow up 258 points heading towards a 1% lift. I got a 1% lift. S&P 500 up a solid 47 points. NASDAQ 100 on fire, up 1.7 percent. That into Apple earnings tomorrow, at least I should point out. Ten-year yield, 18 basis points, a ah, modest uh, move as well. And the real yield, Lisa, craters 2.50 percent after my first glass of Tang this morning. And we are down 16 basis points on the inflation-adjusted yield. The operative word, folks, is never. I don't think I've ever seen that. It has been a pretty significant move and continues. Uh, to be as the session grows older. Let's check back in with our own Michael McKee, who is in the room in Washington, D.C. Mike, uh, do you think the Fed would be disappointed to see the market's reaction to Fed Chair Jay Powell's press conference? I'm uh, not disappointed in that sense. Uh, clearly, if we continue to see this kind of drop in yields, it's going to take some of that market pressure off of the uh, economy, and the Fed sort of goes backwards a little bit. But I don't think they are counting on the markets being tight for a long time to completely do their job for them. Because as you mentioned just a moment ago, if you get a, a blowout number on Friday, then everybody's going to reverse. I think the takeaway here is that uh, the Fed would like to be done, or at least at peak, and switch to the idea of uh, how long, but they can't be sure yet. And I think the analogy I would use is the uh, the Fed chairman is Potter Stewart at this point, the uh, former Supreme Court justice who said that he could not define pornography, but he knew it when he sees it. Uh, at this point, the Fed can't define what sufficiently tight is, but meeting by meeting, they will decide what they see. So you kind of throw out the dot plot, which is uh, what I was getting at with my question yeah. to him. Uh, the markets can't predict anymore what the Fed is going to do. They have to go into every meeting trying to assess what the Fed will think about conditions at the time, rather than some right. sort of objective data release. And Mike McKee, in your tenure, back to Arthur Burns. You were a young buck there with Arthur Burns a few years ago. Have you ever seen a Fed working away from theory, away from the orthodox? They seem to be literally, as you and Steve Leisman alluded to, making it up meeting to meeting. Yeah, I mean, orthodoxy changes, obviously, and uh, the time from Burns to Greenspan, it changed quite a bit. And uh, it, it's still uh, a Fed truism that the inflation is kind of the key to everything. But uh, they don't know what's going on. The models don't work or haven't worked coming out of the pandemic. It's all something new. So they are doing their best to try to figure out what's going on without using some of the history-based models and, uh, and uh, previous um, outcomes that they would have had to uh, to use in the past. And this will engender a lot of rewrites of monetary policy thinking, I'm sure, going down the road. Just to sum this all up, is strategically patient the new sufficiently restrictive? I saw that <laughs> comment, and I, I think it is uh, it, it, it sums it up pretty well. Um, they are going to be patient. They're going to have to have a good reason to do whatever, oh, whether it's man. cutting rates, raising rates. Uh, they will not have to have a good reason to just uh, leave rates where they are. They can just go with the economy as they see it. Michael McKee, thank you, and wonderful question, as always. Were, strategically patient. Were you strategically patient last night at 9 p.m.? Absolutely with the not. No, I was Howie. not. Absolutely. Uh, with 
the I, sugar highs, et cetera. But this, to me, really uh, highlights what, I, what they're saying. And then you put the stock chart and you put the bond chart next to it and you hear what the bond market is hearing. Just want to point this out to your please. yields. 4.93% getting close to crossing yeah. that threshold into the 4.9. Well, do, uh, now it's uh, bouncing around, but just highlights what a massive move we've seen on the yeah. front end. Massive is defined by the pros, folks, and we welcome all of you not part of Global Wall Street. People look at this strange phrase, standard deviation, and all you need to know is you look back 20 days, 40 days, whatever, 20 weeks, and you try to figure out how much have we moved off the center trend. Jeffrey Rosenberg of Black BlackRock knows we've seen a standard deviation move. He is with their systematic multi-strategy fund. Oh, I can see you in the classroom as a freshman at Carnegie Mellon, Jeff Rosenberg, going, what in God's name is standard deviation? Did we get a jump condition today, Jeff Rosenberg, towards a less restrictive Fed? Well, as Lisa pointed out earlier, there's a, there's a lot of data coming out today, and so parsing out the reaction from the Fed versus the earlier, you know, kind of main event behind the Treasury refunding uh, is, a, is a little bit tricky, but I, I would highlight that the main kind of differentiation is really the reaction in the front end of the curve, right? From the refunding announcement, that was really the back end, as Lisa highlighted, a little bit of the weaker data on PMIs also hurt, helping the back end rally. But the Fed market reaction was really in the front end. So I think, Powell, you want to look at the statement and you want to look at the opening to the press conference. That's what they intended to say versus what the market interpreted from the Q&A. What they intended to say was to try to be balanced. Resiliency on economic growth implies we need to stay tight, maybe do one more against the tightening of financial conditions, which implies maybe we've, we've done enough. That's what they were hoping to say. Clearly what the market saw was a, a preference for the worry of tightening financial conditions. We're at sufficiently restrictive. We can be done. And so you price out the little bit of probability for the, ne for the next hike. That's the market reaction. Action, as you went over in the earlier segment with, with, with Dudley, you know, it remains to be seen. The data will dictate that. Uh, but certainly, to your question, Tom, big reaction. I think a lot more of that standard deviation move has to do with refunding earlier, a mm -hmm. little bit coming out of this press conference. Well, how do you play this then, Jeff? If you think that the market is reading way too much into what Jay Powell said, which was trying to stick close to the script, although perhaps giving a different tone than people thought of, do you then sell to your notes and wait for them? for yields to go back up, for them to cheapen and buy them back? Well, you know, I think it's less a question about selling the two-year note now. I think given the pricing and given the, the, the data that we have that Powell referred to, two more inflation prints, two more labor prints, and what Dudley was just hinting at, you know, are we really seeing the degree of tightness, the degree of sufficiently restrictive, given the, the trajectory of growth that we just came off of? Obviously, no one expects that to persist, but the risk there is that you, you're you're not pricing enough of the possibility of another hike, and so maybe you hold off on adding twos from, from at, at these levels. Yeah, Jeff, from where you sit at BlackRock, and I understand there's an index play here, but there's some active management, and you're watching everybody else in the game. What's the bet of the market right now? Is the bet that we're going to get this Fed done in a more dovish, less restrictive tone, or is the bet, hey, we're scared stiff and we may move higher? Well, I mean, you have a num you have a couple of different cross currents on there. You know, obviously, there's been a, a lot of talk about uh, movement into the long end, movement of of retail flows, buying the long end. That's yeah. very much kind of we're 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 at or close to the end, and we're going back to the old playbook that uh, you know once the Fed is done tightening, then you get a big rally. I think I think you got to be a little bit cautious about we're just simply going back to the old playbook, but certainly. You know, there's a degree of that in the market. And then the other really big kind of consensus story is around the steepness of the curve, that the curve is just way too inverted, that you need to see normalization of the curve, all the factors around that. You know, the refunding was a little bit of, of that, that that kicked in post the August refunding announcement. Uh, Japan and the news on the BOJ and yield curve right, control, right. Uh, you know, deficit financing. There's a litany of lists, but there's a very yeah. popular positioning around the steepening. And I think the reaction 
addition to the refunding earlier today really reflects that very crowded steepening yeah. position that that uh, exacerbates that standard deviation move that we saw earlier. Today. Jeff, I want to go full circle to where Lisa and I were early this morning, folks. We've been live since 2 a.m. this morning. It's really you know you know quite something. And Jeff, it's about the commercial banking system of America, which the chairman alluded to maybe a little bit and maybe not enough uh, for my taste. Can we get a bond market that heals to take those bond losses and drift them away into 2025, where things can even get better if we don't get a massive bond move, but just enough of a bond move? Is that really the strategy here? No, and and you you did hear that question. It was probably one of the few questions uh, on that on that topic. I mean, this is a historic move in terms of interest rates. So you know, even if you get a, a, a modest kind of cut in interest rates that the bond market in the second half of 2024 is anticipating, uh, that's nowhere near enough to kind of unwind yeah. the unrealized losses that you're talking about from this historic move from zero to five. So that's really about a long-term story of rep repairing capital and dealing with those issues within the, within the banking system, that if you, if you kind of repair the funding concerns, and that was what the bank term funding question was referring to, then maybe that doesn't become a crisis moment, but it's still becomes kind of a longer term drag in terms of capital repair that even a, a small rally as is, is anticipated in the bond market pricing for 2024 isn't going to be sufficient to repair. Jeff you talked about positioning and I want to go there because a lot of people are saying short squeeze this is a positioning squeeze and we've been hearing well that said. a lot. Yes. How yes. much is levered funds that have come into the Treasury market how much is that what's underpinning some of the incredible volatility that we've seen over recent weeks. Well, you know, that's, that's a tough one to sort of pin it on, on, on leverage. You, you know, th there's a lot of drivers to that volatility and to that uncertainty. Uh, you know, positioning and crowded positioning exacerbates those moves. And that's, that can be levered. It can be unlevered. Uh, it can be just asset managers who favor well, uh, particular I, positions. I don't mean to interrupt, Sorry, Jeff, but there's a difference between real money investors who are making a long-term bet on treasuries and people who are fast positioning, trying to make a trade. Or is the market right now being determined by the trading types, not by the real money? I mean, in short-term reactions, absolutely, right? Leverage is going to exacerbate reactions to price movements. Um, so I think it's really about, you know, decoupling. And you said it earlier, you know, the, the near-term reaction isn't always to any data point, whether, whether we're talking about the press conference or on Friday to payroll or CPI. That near-term move, yes, that's going to be dictated by algos. It's going to be dictated soon by AI. It's going to be dictated by the lever positions and crowded positioning. But let's separate that from kind of the longer run impact of the fundamental signaling. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, you can have the near term reaction and then a day later or two days later, you know, it's a very different trend as as we parse the, the totality of the data. But certainly yeah. very short term price reactions are going to be driven by those levered factors. Jeff Rosenberg, thank you so much, as always, for your comments on this incredibly important day. It was supposed to be a snooze fest. It was not absolutely yeah, certainly by the reaction it, it into it wasn't either because yeah. the refunding uh, announcement as well as some of the economic <clears throat> data. But really what we are seeing is a market coalescing around the idea for now that the Fed is right. done with rate hikes for this cycle. And this is completely.